Okay, we'll start off with roll call. Here. 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 Okay. We'll go ahead and start with our report from planning director. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a couple of uh, items to update the commission on. As you noticed, we have our full parking lot available to us now. And so we did not have reserved parking spaces for you. If you find, uh, have a problem finding parking spaces, let us know and we will go ahead and reserve those. But the intent is that there should be adequate parking for everybody now. <laughs> Mr. Sevison, you were, you were here, so I assume you could find a spot out there too. Oh, they did have the marked out? Uh -huh. Oh, way to go, Kathy. Okay. <laughs> as long as we have a quorum, that's always the, uh, that's the key. Uh, a couple of items to update you on as it relates to board action. On the uh, June 23rd board hearing, the board heard the appeal of America's, America's Tire Company. That was a project over here on Highway 49 at Willow Creek Road. The board was concerned that the standards being applied to the America's Tire Company were different from those that were applied to Les Schwab. Uh, while not incorrect, the Les Schwab standards were more conservative and the uh, board wanted the applicant to go back and redesign the project with the more conservative setback standards to see what might result. And so they continued action on that project and it will be heard back before the board at its August 4th meeting. So I will keep you updated uh, as that proceeds through the process. July 7th at the board meeting, they unanimously approved the zoning text amendment for the outdoor eating areas and they uh, approved the language that was modified by the Planning Commission. It went very smoothly and they were very pleased to have that come forward. On July 21st, our Tahoe board meeting the zoning text amendment for the snow removal equipment storage will be coming forward. It has been through not only your planning commission, but the uh, MAX up in Tahoe. And so we are anticipating the board to take action on the 21st. Just a reminder that your July 23rd meeting uh, has been canceled. Your next meeting will be on August 13th. And that concludes staff's comments. Any questions? Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Okay, at this time, I'll open it up to public comment. And this is an opportunity for anybody to discuss any issues that you want, except what is on our agenda today. So if anybody else out there has any comments, now's your time. Seeing none, I'll go ahead and. Add move on to our 1005 item and it's a withdrawal of an appeal. Thank you Mr. Chairman. The item before you today is a withdrawal of an appeal um, of the zoning administrator's decision to deny a minor use permit. Um, the project is the Hilton Manor Elder Care Facility um, project which uh, is a 17 proposed 17 bed elder care home in an existing facility previously utilized for elder care this project is located at uh, 305 Hilton Drive in the Applegate area uh, approximately three tenths of a mile from the intersection of Hilton Drive and Lake Arthur Road um, the project was denied without prejudice by the Placer County Zoning Administrator on April 14th um, and then the applicants appealed that decision on April 27th Subsequent to the filing of their appeal, the appellant and applicant Rick Dwyer on behalf of Herb Miller reconsidered and requested that this appeal be withdrawn. Um, as set forth in the zoning ordinance, once an appeal is filed, it cannot be withdrawn without the consent of the appropriate hearing body. And so accordingly, staff does recommend that the Planning Commission accept this withdrawal of the appeal regarding the zoning administrator's denial of this project 
and direct staff to refund in full the appellant's um, appeal fee of $490. And I'd be happy to answer questions if you have any. No, it doesn't appear we have any. So I guess we'll just bring it back to the commission for motion. Is the, uh, well, maybe I better ask, is the appellant here? Yeah, I'm just checking to see if they, okay, they're, they're not here, so. Okay, I have a, a motion to uh, um, accept in a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, okay. Now, looks like we have uh, just a couple of minutes before we move on to item number two. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on to item number two, tentative subdivision map mitigated ne negative deck on the Gerber Mountain Estates. And Melanie? Thank you. The applicant is requ requesting approval of a tentative subdivision map involving the subdivision of six parcels into 11 single family residential lots over a 57 acre project area. The proposed subdivision will include parcels that range in size from 4.6 to 5.4 acres. The project site is located at the end of Uncle, Uncle Joe's Lane and Reams Road in the Newcastle area. 
The project site is zoned farm with a building site designation of 4.6 acre minimum parcel size. The project site consists of relatively flat topography in the southernmost, excuse me, southernmost section and slopes steeply downward to the north along Auburn Ravine. The site is comprised of grassland area in the southern portion and contains oak woodland areas in the northern portion of the site. As previously stated, the subdivision will include 11 lots that range in size from approximately 4.6 to 5.4 acres and will include improvements to Uncle Joe's Lane. The subdivision will also include the construction of a cul-de-sac to provide access to lots in the northernmost portion of the site. The proposed project also includes a 30,000 gallon water tank that will be located at the southern portion of the site for fire suppression purposes. The pro proposed project will be served by individual private on-site wells and septic systems. The project site is currently developed with two single family residences and a cluster <coughs> structures. As a part of the tentative subdivision map, the northernmost residence will be located on lot three and will continue be, to be occupied by the property owner. The remaining residents and accessory structures will be located on lot two and will also be occupied by a family member. The proposed project underwent environmental review and a mitigated negative declaration has been prepared for the commission's consideration. A number of issues were identified during the review process and they include the following. Community plan consistency. The proposed project is zoned farm with a building site minimum of 4.6 acres and is designated rural residential one to 10 acre minimum in the Placer County General Plan. The project includes parcels that comply with the minimum building site designation and all other standards set forth in the Placer County Zoning Ordinance and the General Plan. Biological resources. Issues that were identified on site include habitat for Cooper's Hawk, an elderberry shrub, wetland and oak woodland areas. The some of these sensitive areas will be impacted by the proposed project Appropriate mitigation has been identified and is included in the conditions of approval. Cultural resources. Two historical features were identified on site. These areas will not be disturbed and a condition of approval that requires the establishment of a resource protection zone has been included in the conditions of approval. Geology and soils. The proposed project includes impacts associated with unstable earth conditions, soil disruptions, displacements, compaction of the soil, and change in topography and ground surface relief features. These impacts will be mitigated to a less than significant level by implementing, implementing the mitigation measures included in the conditions of approval. Hazards and hazardous materials. The project site includes elevated levels of arsenic in the soil and the potential for public health hazards related to mosquitoes. The, um, to prevent future impacts relating from these hazards, the recommended conditions of approval include mitigation measures uh, that will reduce such impacts to a less than significant level. Hydrology and water quality. As a result of the construction of impervious surfaces, water issues have been identified. However, through the implementation of best management practices, these issues will be reduced to a less than significant level. Transportation and traffic um, impacts to site distance at the intersection of Ridge Road and um, Uncle Joe's Lane have been identified. In order to mitigate these impacts, a condition has been included that requires the construction of a public road entrance onto Ridge Road. With that, staff recommends approval of this tentative subdivision map and adoption of the mitigated neg negative declaration. And I'd be happy to answer any questions at this time. Go ahead. Yeah, Melanie, uh, I as I was looking at the project, and I actually went on the ground too, and looked at least from the road, looked at it, but couple er at least one area that I uh, was wondering about is I noticed a couple of lots have uh, a building envelope that's on a fairly steep slope mm -hmm. and, and you know a couple cases one was like 50 foot from the top to the bottom that one was 70 foot from the top to the bottom so it seems like uh, in those cases people would be attempting to build houses on what appears to be a very st steep slope what are some of your thoughts on it or how did how did that get uh, mitigated I guess in the wash well, uh, generally those would just be identified for the most appropriate areas to, to construct a house. So um, I, the engineer would have decided to basically see what was most appropriate and then develop those envelopes. So even though it may be the steepest area, it may be the best for construction and that may also have to do with where they can locate the septic system and the wells on site. Okay, so at least 
from the county's perspective, there's not an issue with uh, steep slopes and building on them? No, because, I mean, they will, they'll be required to meet the building standards for those slopes and then also meet um, whatever, um, you know, for soil and water quality issues that may be impacted by that, they'll have to meet those standards also. So it should be basically any effects that, that may occur, they will be mitigated for. Okay, so that in, in, the, in, uh, in the case that these parcels are not developable because of they can't meet those standards and they'd just be not developable in the future. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. I think what you're saying is they have to meet several mitigation standards as the sites are reviewed for development as the proposal comes in and then if they can't meet those mitigations then they'll just be undevelopable. Well, no, it wouldn't be un uh, did you say undevelopable? Is that what Yeah, if they can't I'm meet sorry. the mitigations that you talked about. Right. Oh, no, there's no they would have to meet all mitigations and there's no way I mean we would have we've already looked at these you know so that they can meet mitigation measures because we can, we wouldn't be suggesting approval of lots that wouldn't be able to meet them. So they're all they I mean the the building envelopes are developable and I believe during the improvement plan process, they can be modified if, if there's an issue. Is that? I think uh, maybe another thing to add to um, Commissioner Johnson is that if the grading associated with the development of a project site is over 250 cu cubic yards, they will be subject to a, a grading permit and that will look at any type of uh, cuts and fills and, and potential erosion associated with that cut. So that'll address any issues associated with the, the grading on a, on a slope. Okay. So it'll depend upon the people that want to uh, build a house that they review all the requirements they're going to have to go through before they build it by that lot. Right. It'll be subject to a grading permit. Okay. And, and versus step foundations, and I think at some point we, if the slope is greater than whatever, that they would be required to use a, a, a step foundation type system rather than a slab. Yeah, I, I remember uh, prior I subdivisions where Road, we required uh, instead of slabs uh, step foundations, but I'm not sure if we've required it on this project. We'll have to take a look at it. Um, sounds like we did not require. Maybe something we can think about is require the step foundation the step foundation as opposed to cutting a huge cut in the side of the hill for a slab you know, I don't know there's no, there's no reason why they couldn't do that so that might be a solution to your problem okay <coughs> make it complicated for you <laughs> any other questions uh, one for you I don't know if I missed it in the report or not but uh, here's your impact uh, on the arsenic Finding. Did we cover that in here? Um, did you? I, I think didn't see a condition that relates to it. There the is. Is I'm there sorry. one? Yes, there is. Um, let's see if I can That's find That's a it. disclosure type thing that they have to do when they <laughs> sell the lots. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear you. Could you? That, isn't that? that a disclosure type item that has to be uh, disclosed when they sell the lots? You know, I don't. There yet? Yeah, well, let me find the condition, and then I know that they need to. Beg your pardon. If it's naturally occurring, it may not be necessary. Well, I know, but uh, anybody buying the lot surely wants to know that uh, there is that problem there. So I just didn't see it. Okay, um, there is a mitigation measure. Um, what page is that, Melanie? This, this is, I'm sorry, I'm on 17 of 31 of the mitigated negative declaration. Okay. The mitigation measure has been incorporated into the conditions of approval. Um, it states that the project shall conduct a preliminary endangerment assessment of the California Department of Toxic Sub Substances Control Standards. Um, it discusses uh, that this needs to be completed um, prior to the uh, submittal of improvement plans. Um, and 
it says any remedial action indicated by the preliminary endangerment assessment shall be completed and certified prior to the approval of improvement plans. Um, so basically they need to get it taken care of prior to improvement plan approval. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Uh, yeah, you mentioned that uh, there were two historical sites found, is that correct? That is correct. And what, if any, uh, um, uh, attention has been paid to access to these historical sites? Um, no attention, there's nothing as far as access, there's a protection easement that's going around them, so just uh, resource protection. protected, but nobody can get to it. Um, I well, they're located on the project site, so the, per the owner of the property could get to it, but we're not disclosing where those are located. We have the, well, excuse me, we are as, m as far as we're putting the resource in there, but we're not specifically stating what it is or where it is on the property. It's not meant to be accessed for, you know, research purposes or anything to that effect. And so why was that identified in the first place? It's identified because it's a sensitive resource and we don't want it to be disturbed uh -huh. in case there needs to be future research in the area, but. But nobody can get to it without the owner's permission or something like that? That would basically be correct, yes. Interesting. And was there any consideration to any trails uh, in this? Uh, yes. Uh, there, could you explain that a little? They have not been identified in the community plan. And so parks did not see that it was necessary to include trails. No other questions? Thank you, Melanie. Okay, would the applicant or the representative like to come to the podium and speak on this? <clears throat> uh, good morning, commissioners and staff. I'm Steve Frazier from Roosevelt Design Group, representing Barney Gruber on the project. Um, I would uh, start by addressing Mr. Gray's question. The uh, access to that is not accessible from this piece of property because Auburn Ravine cuts off a small portion of the property in the back and that borders on other lots that uh, it's actually an undevelopable uh, portion of the property. So unless they want to traverse across Auburn Ravine, they can't get to it without permission from other surrounding owners that we have no control over. And that was some Indian artifacts that they had found. And, and so anyway, we're not developing that portion. Um, in, uh, I forget who asked about the foundation. <coughs> Those sites would not be developable uh, practically with slab on grade. They would have to use step foundations. And we have long um, uh, building envelopes where you're, you're seeing the 50 foot grade difference in them. But the practical area that would be developed would be much smaller and have a much less slope across the property. But still, it would be practical to put a uh, entrance in and a walkout basement would be the, the way to develop those lots. Let me see, would you, would you mind if we address the uh, step foundation? It sounds like you would be agreeable to that. Sure, I don't see how you would, you wouldn't build it any other way. Yeah, okay, yeah. thank you. Sure, and we find uh, uh, no objection to any of the conditions. Uh, Staff did a, a good job. We had a good relationship working on this project, and, and uh, we find uh, everything in conformance, and we just ask for your approval. Okay. I can answer any other questions that you have. Questions? Okay, thank you. Sure. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak to this? Please state your name. Hi, my name is Rick Williams. I'm a uh, property owner adjacent to Barney Gruber Mountain Estates, and um, I bring no appeals to the table today, but I have a few questions about the project that I uh, hope do not lead to an appeal. So first question I have is um, my, view, my view from my property um, looks east and north relative to development, and uh, I guess my primary concern is, is the routing of utility lines and telephone lines. If that runs on either one of those perimeters, that could compromise my, my view. Does it compromise the value of the property? I don't know. So that's the first question I have is what, what, is, what are the plans for routing the uh, uh, power and, and phone lines? Are they above ground or are they below ground? 
Uh, okay. Why, why don't we we'll just get get all these? Get all the questions. Yeah, we'll get all okay. the questions. And okay. And I had a question with respect to uh, uh, how the uh, connection will be made uh, for the the paved portion of the subdivision road to the existing dirt road that that services uh, three residences, mine which is one. Um, uh, with respect to you know uh, visibility, don't want a blind curve, and we can easily connect to it, and it's at the right you know the right um, uh, pitch and so forth. So as, as we turn, we don't have a negative pitch, and just general questions uh, about that. Um, there's a pad marked water tank storage. I guess that's for fire. I, I assume that that's where you'll put the thirty thousand gallon. Okay, water tank. Just wanted to make sure that wasn't somewhere below. And I'm looking right over the top of that. Um, are, are you planning to install street lighting? Um, just, just address us and then. Okay, I'll, I'll ask a question. So the question on if street lighting is uh, planning to be installed, um, are they planning any road name changes? Are you planning to install an, an entrance structure or uh, you know, a gate that leads into the uh, subdivision? And I had a, uh, one question about um, grading. There's a uh, grading that looks like it's proposed uh, that's required for a, a to make um, enough room for a turnabout, and, it, and it's there, it. Um, I just had a question: of How far up on my property that's going to, uh, um, you know, going going to encroach upon? That's going to go beyond uh, the easements or whatever. So, those are my questions. If that's if that's it, then we'll try to get answers. Okay, Melanie, would it be something that you want or public work? <laughs> <laughs> I could begin. Okay, uh, Rebecca power Tabor. And phone. Yeah, Rebecca Tabor from Engineering and Surveying. Um, I actually did speak on the phone with uh, Mr. Williams yesterday. We addressed a couple of these issues, but uh, there's some some additional ones today. Um, power poles, and and actually, I'd ask that we we also ask the applicant engineer about that. Um, this level of detail that we reviewed doesn't include electrical, you know, utility service. We, and, you know, that's something that the utility companies will have a say in, their standards and, and placement. Um, it, it's, I do know, though, in our general plan, um, this is an area where we don't require undergrounding of electrical lines, power lines. So um, we ask you know, the engineer applicant, what they propose to do. Um, the street lighting, no, there is no street lighting uh, planned or required um, in this rural area. Um, there's no road name changes uh, requested, and at this time the both road names are, um, they're not duplicates or anything, they would, they would be the same, the road names would stay the same. Uh, there's no entrance structures proposed, no gates. Um, and a grade, grading for a turnaround, um, I don't believe there would be any impacts to Mr. Williams' project or property, um, but we could also ask the engineer um, about that. Yeah, I'd say I, think you, uh, I guess what I was wondering there is I, I thought I heard him saying, uh, I think it's on, on, I think it's Fox Lane, right? Yeah. And I think that's the one he's talking about. He's wondering about the connection of the pavement to where his dirt road takes off. In other words, I guess the standard is that right. the standard is standards. There. That was one I didn't address. Okay, thank you. Um, actually, it's off of Uncle Joe's Lane, and um, it. I don't know if we can bring up the tentative map up on the screen, but there is a part of the project requires construction of a stub a paved um, stub to his existing dirt road, and it, it will veer off from the newly constructed Uncle Joe's Lane. Um, within the Gruber property, it will be paved, and then it'll conform to the existing dirt road, and it should be a smooth. The, the details will be worked out in the improvement plan review process, but it, it will be a smooth, safe access. Yeah, because I assume it would be to county standard mm -hmm. some kind of road <laughs> conformance. Okay. And 
I guess I could, I don't have a pointer, but um, what I was going to show you is where that's located. It's lot three, um, kind of in the middle of the project there. You, you can see, kind of make out the connection going to the west. There you go. Right here. Yes. Thank you. So that's the connection to the dirt road. <coughs> yeah, the, 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 um, the grading in question that I had was actually right here for this um, to make the, uh, the road width. I, I think, I think if, the, if the grading is all within easement, I'm, I'm fine with that. I just don't yeah. think there's, there was anything additional required for this area. Mr. Chairman, also like to add that uh, in relationship to the street lighting, uh, issue. Uh, condition number tw 26 says that if there is street lights that they shall uh, comply with the uh, dark st sky standards. So if there were to ever to be street lights, they'll have to do that. And then if re in reference to the gates, there is a uh, condition 73 on page 24 requires that all future uh, proposed gate uh, entries uh, shall have to come back to the Planning Commission for approval. Okay, thank you. Okay, is there anyone else in the audience that would like to speak to this issue? Seeing none, I'll close it off and bring it back to the commission for discussion or action. Okay, one thing I'd like to maybe follow up, even though it sounds like it's going to happen anyway, is just to include in the conditions that step foundation if the grading is over 250 uh, cubic yards. Does that make sense? Just to make it clear, well, that that's what I think. I think that typically what they do is relate it not to the cubic yards, but to the slope of the, the slope. slope. Okay. It's over so many degrees. That yeah, the conditions I, would be required. Okay, slope-wise, <coughs> maybe there's a recommendation there. When um, I was uh, thinking about 20 percent greater than 20 percent slope. Okay. So. Yeah. Well, if if we could change the wording somewhere in the conditions, I'd like to include that myself. So what, what I was thinking here is that all new construction uh, on, of single-family dwellings on lots with uh, slopes greater than 20% 20, 20 shall be constructed, uh, t greater than 20% under the proposed foundation shall be constructed utilizing step foundations excluding garages uh, and then notification to all future property owners of this requirement uh, shall be uh, completed. That answers my concern. Okay. okay. Anybody else have any, any comments? Okay. okay, well, I would make a motion then that we, uh, with the uh, a change to the conditions that was just read, that we uh, approve this project. And with that, uh, let me get back to the page here, uh, that we uh, approve the tentative sub subdivision map based on the findings. And the recommended conditions include the one we just mentioned uh, and approve the uh, CEQ uh, mitigated declaration findings as well as the 10. Yeah, so that's my motion. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. If anybody would appeal this, the um, appeal should be filed at the planning department. Time to file appeals is 10 calendar days and the appeal fee is $495. Jay, are you about? Are you set? I think so. Oh, okay. Sorry for the delay. <laughs> okay, we'll go ahead and go to 
Item number three, general plan amendment rezone vesting tentative subdivision map and conditional use permit, tree <coughs> permit and mitigated negative declaration enclave at Granite Bay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Uh, I'm E.J. Evaldi with the, uh, with the planning department. Uh, ju just to make sure you guys should have copies of uh, some additional correspondence that came in this morning and last night uh, or yesterday and also an addendum uh, with some revised findings. Just want to make sure you guys have those on hand for later. Uh, this item before you is the enclave at Granite Bay. Uh, what the applicant is proposing is to subdivide a 12-acre infill site into a 27-lot planned development for residents that are age 55 and older. The requested entitlements include a general plan amendment, a rezone, vesting tentative subdivision map, a conditional use permit, and a tree permit. The uh, project site is located in Granite Bay on the north side of Elmhurst Drive at the intersection of Swan Lake Drive, as shown on the vicinity map. I'll put an aerial photo up now, which, which hopefully you can see. Uh, this 12-acre site is uh, relatively flat, uh, covered with grasslands and native trees, including two landmark cottonwood trees. Uh, there are several small seasonal wetlands on site and a large emergent marsh located in the southern portion of the property. Uh, that's actually a tributary to Linda Creek down on the, no, see if I can, down along in this area. Uh, surrounding properties include large lot rural residential land uses to the north, uh, that includes the terminus of Skyview Lane, which is right up here. Uh, there are rural low-density residential uses to the east, uh, including the terminus of Pastor Drive. Pastor Drive comes up here, and then you have residences right in this area. Let's see, Elmhurst Drive and Linda Creek Court border the project site to the south along right where I was just talking about, and down below in this area there's some uh, low-density residential uses. And then uh, to the west of the site is the Ridgeview Elementary and Oak Hill Schools. Uh, right up in this area, the ball field actually backs up to the project site, and then there's some other residential uses right in this area. So the applicant has uh, designed the project to comply with the county's planned development, development ordinance. Uh, up on the screen is the tentative subdivision map. Uh, the proposed 27 lots would range in area from uh, 5,300 square feet to 11,400 square feet. The residence would be limited to single story and would not exceed uh, 2,600 square feet in size. Uh, approximately 49% of the project site would be set aside in open space and common area lots for wetland preservation, recreational facilities, uh, pedestrian trails, uh, detention basin, and landscaping. Uh, this site plan here may show it a little better. Uh, bocce ball courts are in this area. You can see walking trails uh, throughout. The walking trail actually uh, goes through the property into the school site uh, and then out, of course, down to Elmhurst. Uh, there's also a uh, kind of a passive recreation here with a, uh, a gazebo-type feature and uh, sitting areas. Primary access to the project site would be Swan Lake Drive at the intersection of Elmhurst Drive down in this area. Uh, there would also be an extension of two public roads, Swan Lake Drive and Pasture Drive, which comes up through this way, and then Pasture Drive comes through there. Uh, and they would connect to form a looped roadway, uh, which is proposed at 42 foot wide. Uh, there's also a 40 foot wide emergency vehicle access and utility easement with a 20 foot all weather surface. Uh, an emergency roadway that would be provided to Skyview Lane, uh, which is a private street to the north, which is up right through this area. So the project will require a general plan amendment to change the uh, Granite Bay Community Plan land use designation from rural residential, uh, which is a 2.3 to 4.6 acre minimum, and rural low density residential, which is only a small portion is designated that down in this area. And I'll go to a, the actual uh, community plan map that shows that, uh, and, and the proposed changes to low density residential, uh, which would allow uh, 0.4 to 0.9 acres per dwelling unit. Uh, staff will be asking that the planning commission uh, make a recommendation to the board of supervisors on whether this change is warranted at this time. Uh, the original intent of the rural residential designation is to preserve the rural character of specific areas within the Granite Bay community 
by allowing agricultural uses, uh, particularly the recreational use of horses, and providing home sites for that portion of the population that needs or wants larger lots and a rural environment in which to live and raise a family yet does not need a larger parcel of land to enjoy the rural atmosphere. Uh, the project site is clearly part of a large rural residential area that extends north to Douglas Boulevard. Uh, this is this whole area and it continues on up this way towards Douglas. Uh, the property could arguably be considered to be located in a transition zone between the large rural lots and the Tree Lake development to the south of the project, which is down, down this area. Uh, unfortunately, the project at the density proposed and with some of the smallest lot sizes proposed in the Granite Bay area would not offer any transition between the rural residential and low, de low density residential land uses. It is staff's opinion uh, that the proposed general plan amendment would create a conflict between the existing adjacent rural residential land use designation and rural low density land use designation. Uh, there has been no justification for a change in the existing designation based upon change in circumstance since the original designation as part of the adoption of the Granite Bay Community Plan 20 years ago. Uh, for information purposes, in January, the county opened up the Granite Bay Community Plan for review. Uh, many of you are familiar that we're going through that process right now. Uh, and, and staff is of the opinion that it would be more appropriate to consider this new land use designation uh, in the context of a general review of the community plan as a whole. Up uh, on the board is a rezone exhibit. Uh, as part of this request, their applicant is requesting to rezone the property from RAD 100, which is a 28.3 acre minimum zoning, uh, to RSAGBX. Uh, with a 17,000 square foot minimum lot size. However, it would also have a planned development designation of 2.6, which would allow these smaller lot sizes. Uh, this would allow the density on site to be increased from a potential of six residential units to 27 residential units. Although the additional 21 residential lots may not significantly impact the overall population of Granite Bay, it will certainly impact the immediate neighborhood. Uh, with two elementary schools, a uh, high school, and a community park nearby, uh, traffic and circulation patterns for vehicles and the potential for conflicts with pedestrians, including school children, will be affected by the increase in density. I will also talk about the landmark cottonwood trees. Uh, back in 2001, uh, the Placer County Board of Supervisors designated the two cottonwood trees as landmark trees. Uh, at that time, the Board of Supervisors determined that the cottonwood trees were a significant community benefit and of high quality to wildlife and could support nesting raptors. That's how their resolution stated. Uh, what the applicant is requesting is to remove these cottonwood trees uh, to allow access for the project site from Elmhurst Drive. Uh, this is ultimately a policy decision by the Board of Supervisors, uh, but the county prepared arborist report, which includes a peer review of the applicant prepared arborist reports, uh, indicates that the landmark trees would remain in fairly good health if recommended maintenance is performed and there's no disturbance to the root, zo root zone of the trees with development. A mitigated negative declaration has been prepared for this project uh, and although the analysis determined that the project could result in potentially significant impacts, uh, all impacts are found to be mitigated to a less than significant level. Uh, at this time though, the Development Review Committee uh, is not recommending approval of an environmental document due to our position on the general plan amendment and the rezone. The Granite Bay Municipal Advisory Council reviewed this proposal at their May 3, 2009 meeting and voted unanimously 7-0 to recommend denial of the project. Uh, the majority of public comment was provided by neighboring property owners expressing concerns about traffic, land use compatibility, and development of a senior community with no nearby services or public transportation. So with that, uh, the Development Review Committee is recommending that the Planning Commission recommend to the Board of Supervisors denial of the applicant's request for a general plan amendment, rezone, tentative subdivision map, conditional use permit, and tree permit. Uh, that's based upon the findings contained within the addendum uh, that we provided with you today. Uh, in the event that the Commission and our Board of Supervisors determine that the project warrants further consideration, uh, the project will be remanded back to the Planning Commission uh, for consideration of the mitigated negative declaration 
and to discuss the merits of the project, uh, including conditions of approval and revised findings. Uh, so with that, that concludes my report. Uh, I understand the applicant is here and they have a PowerPoint presentation of their own. Uh, and so I'm available to answer questions or, or I, can, I can wait too. <laughs> Maybe, maybe we'll just wait till after the presentation. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Got it. Good morning, members of the Planning Commission. I'm Camille Courtney. I'm the president of Rancho Cortina Properties and we're a land use and a development consulting firm. We've also been home builders since 1980, and for uh, reasons which still uh, escape me at times, we have seen fit to do what I call innovative housing. We've had a number of experiences where we've been asked to go into a community and develop housing that hasn't been seen before. We did this several times along the Central Coast in a community called Paso Robles that many of you may know of, very rural. We were the first home builder to build homes on a 6,000 square foot lot which was at that point very small for that rural community, instantly sold to people that were looking for a pre-retirement home. We had such success there, we did another 173 lot subdivision. Very similar issues to this community. In 2005, we were contacted by the Pastor family, which has owned this property for well over 60 years. Um, they had expressed to me their interest in doing something with this property and asked our professional opinion as to what to do. The first thing we did is take a look at the market, take a look at the area, drive around Granite Bay and familiarize ourselves with the kind of real estate that's there now. And it seemed very obvious to me that what we didn't need was more 2.3 acre lots in Granite Bay, nor did we need any more 800,000 to a million dollar homes. That was being well supplied, in fact oversupplied, and wasn't being sold. But what we did need was something to allow people to stay in the community that they love. And one of the benefits of Granite Bay is it has this strong sense of community. And I'm sure all of you know people who are living in a home that is too big for them now and has too much landscaping to maintain. And yet they don't move because they have no other option. There's been prominent people in the community that have left the community when they had to move. And that's unfortunate because you lose those resources. So after we took a look at the area and I suggested that we consider a type of home that's new and somewhat innovative, we thought we'd better validate this idea. So we first contacted the Gregory Group, which is a leading economic marketing feasibility company in the Sacramento Valley. They're quoted in the Sacramento Bee all the time, Sacramento Business Journal. They too went out and looked at the area, inventory, the types of homes were for sale, the types of lots that were available, made the same conclusions. We supplied staff with a copy of that report. But we didn't stop there. We then contacted the former vice president for sales and marketing for Pulte, Del Webb. She personally oversaw the sales of 6,000 homes to people that were 55 and older. We felt her knowledge and expertise would be useful to us. She again validated our idea, and you'll hear from her today. And then we recently saw a new, uh, series of newspaper articles in the Sacramento Business Journal. Maybe some of you saw them. I gave you copies of a few of them. But they talked about Escaton developing a model home in Roseville. And the minute I saw that, I went and I visited it because I thought they are on to what we're on to. And in fact, you'll hear from Jeffrey Demure, the architect that designed the home and has in fact set up a design program for them about the need to design homes with special features and, and uh, characteristics that attract people out of the larger homes on the larger lots. So having had all that input, we all were nodding our heads up and down. So we decided to proceed. And our environmental studies began in 2006. So here we are in 2009. So we've been at the planning process for three years. We first submitted our applications to the city in June of 2006. We had a pre-development meeting. We came back after a year and a half of environmental studies and filed our applications. So that speaks a little bit to why we're not in the community plan update process. We were given the option last January when Supervisor Euler's office announced the update if we wanted to sideline our planning process, wait to go into that community planning process. And I couldn't see how that was fair to my client after two and a half years. 
and I didn't see that we would get to any different conclusion than we are to today. So with that, let me share a little bit about our vision for what it is that we'd like to see happen here. And uh, as I indicated to you, we're going to have a couple of experts that know a little bit more about the subject than I do speak. So, As you've heard from staff, 27 lots in Granite Bay. I'm going to jump through these because EJ had these. So what is proposed? We've got 27 lots on 12 acres with 49% of the site left as open space. It's not fenced. It's not gated. It has walking paths through it to include the community in our neighborhood, bocce ball courts. We've improved a permanent walkway to the school, which has never been improved. It's been a dirt path for decades. Recently, we fenced the site because we had unlicensed motorcycle kids out there whooping around. Got a lot of calls from the neighbors. Didn't like that one bit because they've enjoyed walking across this property for 60 years. We acknowledge that. We'll allow that to continue. If it were estates on large lots, I submit to you that would probably not be the case. We've designed all of our homes as one story, not 35 feet high, which is the zoning code out there right now. And as any of you have driven, I know some of you have gone by the site, the many mansions that are out there are quite imposing. We have and we are desirous of marketing these homes to people that are considered pre-retirement, retirees, living in place, and you're going to hear a lot more about what that truly means. It's just not a moniker. There's a lot involved in that. We're incorporating solar into these homes, which we think is also extremely important. And as I said to you, we looked at the market and feel this is ideal for the target market. In addition to that, all of the front yards will be maintained by the Homeowners Association, and all the open space will be maintained by the Homeowners Association. And one question that's come up several times is, why 27 homes? Why not 10? Why not 12? Why not 15? We wanted our HOA dues to be about $200 a month. When we contacted the companies that do those HOA budgets and went through that process on a schematic basis, we're right around $200 a month for 27 homes. You get less than that, it keeps going up and up and up. The more open space that you have, the more you have to pay to maintain it. We can't give it to the county, we have to maintain it. So that's why we're at that number. That made sense to us. I've talked briefly about this, but I wanted you to know some of the, some of the actual s statistics. We're at almost 30% in Granite Bay alone that's over 55. Okay. These homes are going to include features to age in place. These are not assisted living homes. These are not people that don't drive. These people have two cars. They're very active. And they want to stay in their community where they are right now. They don't want to leave their community. They simply want to downsize and they don't necessarily want to go to Lincoln or Roosevelt. These buyers take a lot of vacation trips. They want less maintenance. They want an upscale home that include, includes, includes the latest kinds of features. They have the money to do so. They have the equity in their homes to sell. They're one of the few that still do. And we've heard from some of the neighbors that they don't understand why we're doing this in this location. It's an ideal location because it's a, a walking community, great sidewalks, Ron Elfice Park, Granite Bay Golf Course right around the corner, was there the other day, golf course carts running down the roads, perfect place to retire, perfect place to stay in your community, run up Douglas to the shopping along Douglas, Auburn Folsom Road, don't have to get on a freeway to go anywhere, medical offices throughout the area, these people are active, they're vibrant, they bring resources to the community, they shop, they spend money. You can lose them and they'll move out of the community, or you can keep them in the community. Interestingly enough, in El Dorado Hills, there's a similar development called Four Seasons, and I solicited the input of the fire chief, because one of the comments that I have heard at some of our community meetings were, we need to be on a busy road, there's going to be lots of ambulance traffic, lots of fire engine traffic. Well, that's just not the case. And he sent me a letter, I didn't ask him for, but I just thought that it was interesting for me to share with you. His overall impression is that it's way low in terms of the service load. They originally had five to six calls for service a month. In 2007, they experienced eight calls. We were pleasantly surprised at lower call rate. They had seven calls. There's 689 homes there. Now what I'd like to do is introduce you to Jeffrey Demure. He is the architect that has come up with the design concepts and the thoughts that has gone into the Escaton National Demonstration Home. 
Um, and it, it may even be something that you all want to visit. Certainly would have loved to have had you out there. But I would like to introduce Mr. Demir and let him just show you a little bit about what we're thinking about these homes. Thank you, Camille. Thank you, commissioners and staff. I'm Jeffrey Demir, president of Jeffrey Demir and Associates Architects and Planners. And I'm here to talk about what livable design is, the process that we've undertaken on behalf of Escaton Homes or Escaton um, over the last uh, four years. Uh, we looked at what would be appropriate for the aging in place market. We looked at universal design with our client, Escaton, who's been in the business for 41 years. They've been part of our community for that amount of time. They've acknowledged that there needs to be a better way for older adults to be able to maintain their involvement and their placement within the community. So we looked at universal design. And universal design, as it existed four years ago when we started this process, was just an idea. Let me tell you that my organization feels so strongly about this that we undertook this four-year process with Escaton to develop these 100 points of how we could effectively allow a generation to live in place and to age in place. We felt so strongly about this that we undertook this as a pro bono uh, effort on our part. This is the value system that we bring to the solutions that we're going to show you briefly today. And we believe in this because the dignity and the honor that we place on generations that are going to need to be able to stay in the community that they're part of need to be looked at a little bit differently. Is density part of that? Certainly it is. I was taken by the fact that looking at, at this solution, that the overall edges of the community represent 49% of the site that will remain uh, as open space. And I'm also taken by the fact that there's going to be 27 homes and not six or seven homes with eyes on the street. So if I'm a parent in that area and I know that there's some folks with discretionary time that are near a school site, well, we see that as a benefit to bringing those eyes on the street and to bringing a component of safety. My, my vision for the next 30 years for housing is to not have distinct neighborhoods uh, of large tracts of land that segregate certain components of society, but to make a truly multi-generational series of visionary uh, integrated components within communities. That's what this this solution uh, stands for. To let you know how important this has been to the industry in general, we've given five major presentations to five state associations on aging in the last three months. We've given over a thousand tours of this home in the last eight months. The Panasonic engineers from Japan were so taken by this concept of what significant aging means, how it can be addressed in a more meaningful way that they came over and took a tour from Japan. This is a high-end solution that integrates a multitude of different opportunities within a community, which is why we're so excited about it. We think it's meaningful because it represents a visionary standpoint for this community to embrace. So let me walk you through a couple of things that are inherent about this. First of all, visitability. Little things, you're going to look at some of this stuff and you're going to go, well, duh, as my six-year-old would say. This stuff just makes sense. It never existed from a single family detached standpoint before we took on this exercise. Little things that are traditions within the home building industry are being challenged by what we have presented, what we're presenting here today. One little thing like visitability. If I'm 55 and I'm healthy and my, my mother or my father wants to visit me and they're in a, a state of diminished mobility, how are they going to come and see me unless we have zero threshold entries? If I have a son or a daughter that's just returned from Iraq, one of the primary concerns about this group, one of the primary impacts, is limited mobility. If I have a son or a daughter, they can visit me without any loss of dignity. They can get there in and out, um, on their own because we don't have any steps within the home. From the curb to throughout the home, even as far as the shower goes, this all accommodates a more comprehensive view of how we can integrate a multitude of different issues that we're facing as a society and to put it on the front burner. Because a lot of what we've done in the home building industry throughout the years, it does not address these things that have to do with the dignity for how people can live. So what we've done is we've come up with a, a series of solutions that allow people to, to age in place. The home can morph over time. You can remove the toe kick and the doors off your cabinet, and you can slide underneath your stove or other cabinetry within the home. It can accommodate a, a variety of different mobility assistive devices within the home, not because it looks like a handicap suite at an inexpensive motel, but because we have carefully thought through all the different life changes that people will go through 
and we've come up with beautiful solutions that people would be proud to have as part of their neighborhood from, from a, a concept standpoint and also from a, a built standpoint. So as we move ahead, we've identified that 90% of baby boomers want to uh, age in place. They want to live in the community in which they've raised their children. They want to be able to stay there. This is what we are providing here as a solution for that. We also have identified that uh, through the uh, National Association of Home Builders and the um, AARP that less than 12% of the aging population want to live in a major uh, age-restricted community. This would be one of the, the large market rate developments that we've seen in the area. There's only a small percentage of, of society that wants to be able to live there. Another statistic that I think is salient here, within the next 10 years in America, 50% of the population or more will be 55 and older. We need to keep these folks as part of our community, and this is a way that we believe that we can do it. So with that in mind, what I would like to uh, impart upon you is we'd love to have you come out and take a tour of the home. It's not a model home, as Camille said. What it is is a demonstration home. If you want to go out there and buy something, you can't do it. Our client felt so strongly, as did we, about this issue of aging in place that they did this as a museum and it represents an opportunity for other folks within the industry to be able to see what can be done from a built and a beautiful standpoint and from a technology standpoint to allow people to, be, to remain as part of the community and connected there within. So I'll be available for questions. Thank you very much. And real briefly, I would like to introduce Mary Sedlak, the former sales and marketing VP for Pulte, who spoke about Bill Webb. Good morning, Commissioners. I just wanted to take a minute to address the, the market that Del Webb does not serve, and they know that market very well. They've been building 6,000 homes between Roseville and Lincoln alone. There are a lot of people that those homes cannot serve. There is a whole demographic that wants to stay where they were in the first place. They like their doctors. They like their churches. They want to have their family nearby. But they can't afford to stay in a home that requires that amount of maintenance and that size. Those people will not be moving to a Dell Webb community. They don't want to live in a master plan that's that size. And we know that there were a large, large number of those people out there. This is who this community is being built for the people who are from Granite Bay, who want to stay in Granite Bay, who want to stay with their community. And the, the aging in place philosophy is perfect for them. Thank you. And now briefly, we just want to talk a few of the specifics about the site plan. Um, we have an aerial here. I'm just going to. Um, but you saw an earlier aerial, and I just think that it's important, you know, it's kind of a glass half empty. You could say this is the north end of a suburban area or the southerly end of a rural area. Um, but I think what we are proposing is exactly the buffer that needs to be done in traditional planning uh, language, if you will. Um, so on the left, you have the existing general plan. On the right, you have the site and the zoning, and we're 2.27 to the acre here, we're 2.1 to the acre here. Uh, this is our site in between. We're 2.3 acre parcels to the north as well as here. So we're proposing 2.6 units to the acre. We looked at the community plan and we have designed this community to incorporate specific policies that are in the community plan today, their words not ours, to provide sound and adequate housing to meet future needs. You're right. In 1989, when the land use element was proposed, we didn't have the information we have today 20 years later. I submit to you that's a good reason to be having this conversation. It's been 20 years. Some things have changed. We're to encourage innovative development techniques and assure a wide diversification of housing types. We don't have a wide diversification of housing types right now in Granite Bay. The original Tree Lake Master Plan, I'm sure Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Moss can support me, had a PUD element in it for senior housing. They opted to build mini storage instead. But it is a very traditional planning technique. You saw it in Placer Vineyards, you see it all the time, to have lots of different size of lots, 
lots of different types of housing products within a community. It makes it rich. For the most part, we haven't had as much of that in Granite Bay. To provide for clustering of residential units is to maximize the amount of open space. You have big lots, you can't have big open space. It's either or. One-story homes to reduce the visual impacts. We're proposing that. Public services are all to the site. The design element speaks about safeguarding and preserving natural waterways, which we've done, creating open space around it to sit and watch the egrets, whatnot that are there, developing plan unit developments, which we're proposing, to support the design of the lot patterns, clustering, that's what we're proposing. Taking advantage of solar energy, natural stone, which we have shown we want to do, drought tolerant plants in all of our open space areas enhancing the natural setting with our walkways and our benches that are proposed within our landscape plan. I just wanted to make those of you that were unable to get out to the site familiar with what's around it a little bit. Um, it's my little goober, my little red thing. I don't know why my red thing's not working. There it is. Um, we have five dwelling units immediately adjacent to the site and I hope you can all see we're 400 feet away from this property, 50 from this. 68 from here, 64, 190, and 283. What does that look like on the ground? Oh, one other thought. The zoning would allow a 20-foot rear setback, the existing zoning, but we have offered voluntarily a 40-foot setback to the six lots that are adjacent to these two properties. These are the surrounding land uses. This is what it looks like today. That's to the north, the sky view. This is to the east with the two homes on the east. That's the degree of mature landscaping. You can see very little of the existing home. This is southwest to Elmhurst, to the Laurendale property. This is to the Homan property. These were just taken a month ago. I'm going to jump through this. If there's questions about the traffic, we can come back to this, but I'm really wanted to talk a little bit about um, the cottonwood. Uh, we have Chuck Hughes here from Sycamore Environmental. If there's questions about that, we certainly recognize nobody wants to cut down a tree, ever. And, and when we first submitted this project, we thought we could keep it and design our entry around it. But the more arborists that have taken a look at this, and there have been four reports written, and the reports have all said the tree is at way past its useful life. They grow very quickly. They are known to drop the branches unexpectedly. There's recently been a death in Miller Park in Sacramento as a result. The tree, as you can see, overhands the sidewalk. All the school kids walk right down here. It is also obscuring a large granite outcropping. It's covered with cottonwood silk, if anybody's walked out there recently. We want to retain that as our project entry. When we started designing this project, We've had easements going into this site along Elmhurst since the 70s. They're on every single tentative subdivision map and parcel map. The lower section of this property, as you heard earlier from EJ, was part of the original Tree Lake Master Plan Unit 11. It's clearly got an offer of irrevocable dedication for an access easement off Elmhurst. Connecting the north to the south has always been envisioned on this property. And that's one of the reasons that the fire department is pleased to make that connection. Because right now, Pastor Drive is somewhat circuitous, and those people don't have a direct route out in case of a fire. So connecting our site through to Skyview certainly makes sense. You s you've heard that the primary reason the staff has recommended denial is that we haven't made a compelling reason for the change in the general plan. I hope what we've tried to share with you today is there is a compelling reason to change the general plan, and also why we think it's timely to do this. The market is in, as you know, a huge downturn. That won't remain forever, but more importantly, this type of housing has an unmet need. And the National Association of Home Builders has recently sent out an article to that very um, supporting that, that fact that when the market begins to improve, this type of home is going to be in short supply. And where better to do it than in Granite Bay, an innovator, an outstanding design community? Why not take the credit for getting in front of the curve than behind the curve? So this unique approach fills a housing need that's not available. We've provided lots of open space for all the neighbors. We've improved the path for the school children. Traffic impacts are insignificant in the county staff's own M&D mitigated negative deck, insignificant. I'm not going to dwell on that. 
We've got one-story home. They're unobtrusive. We have publicly offered, and will continue to do so, paying school fees. By state law, we don't have to. But we've offered to pay to the Eureka School District $189,000 is what it would be today, $6,000 per dwelling unit. School districts declining enrollment. They don't have the student generation. They need funds. We keep jobs and dollars in the community. This is part of smart growth. You know, you've heard a lot about smart growth. I know the county's talked about it. Sacramento Area Association of Governments have talked about it. You read about it in the newspaper all the time. But really, what is smart growth? And this community and our proposal embodies every aspect of it. There's a mix of land uses. It's a compact building design. It's a walkable neighborhood. It's a range of housing types. It preserves open space and it strengthens and directs development towards existing communities. That's where it needs to go. It's not sprawl oriented. You know, a couple years ago, you had a project, I think, up in Auburn, and some of you were on the Planning Commission, and a number of Sierra Clubs spoke in favor of it. National Resources Defense Council came out about anti-sprawl. This is what we want to do. We want to put housing where it makes sense, where the utilities are there, where the density makes sense, in the least impactful way. And we felt that this was what it did. So with that, I'm available for any questions that you may have of me. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So uh, what's the existing use of this land? Vacant. Nothing. Weeds. Okay. What's the potential uses of the land from the landowner's standpoint? They've never done anything with it other than till the weeds. They could put swine out there, I guess. You know, it's agriculturally zoned. They could have a horse ranch on it. They could raise llamas on it. I guess. You could put six homes under the existing zoning. We'd have to do a tentative map to do that, but you can have six homes on it. So they could sell it as very large estate lots if they felt there was a market for that, and that made sense. And they could have horses in the backyard and flies and manure and cows. And, yep. Okay. Well, I guess to me it seems like if we just look at the parcel there, even though it would be zoned for agriculture, it doesn't have any value as agriculture. It would be more residential. Absolutely not. I mean, that's if you look at this aerial, someone said to me, you know, take a look at what's around it. Does it look to you like it's rural Placer County? Kins in the ag business. I mean, it's not farming ground anymore. Right. Well, I can see where it would be <laughs> potentially rural because there is rural setting in the neighborhood. But as far as agriculture, I, at least I have an impression that there wouldn't be any value to that land as an agricultural entity. No. I suspect having tractors going up and down the road would not probably be well, <laughs> well received by the neighborhood. It's not going to be farmed. It has no economic benefit as farm ground. Has it been farmed in the past? To my knowledge, it's never been farmed in 60 years. No. No. Nope. Not a tree on it. It was probably grazed at one point because there's no trees on it. <clears throat> way, 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 way long ago. Okay. Thank you. Harry? Uh, I'm concerned about a number of things. I live in Del Webb, Roseville, and uh, single stories, you, you, you made a comment uh, that visual impact. I don't believe that people move into a 55 and older project because of visual impact of the home. They don't, but the neighbors are concerned okay. about that. Okay, right. <clears throat> we move there because we didn't want any stairs to climb for right. two-story homes. Right. That's, um, do you have any idea what the response time is from the fire department? Oh, it's less than two minutes. There's yeah. a fire department right around the corner. What is the response time for a fire department to come out? It's less than two minutes is what I've been told, and I don't know if anybody from the fire department's here, Bob Richardson, but there's a, a station. And you made some kind of a comment about how many calls w were made there. In a, in um, I, I shared with you El Dorado County Fire Chief's comment on a similar subdivision in El Dorado County, and it was a quite sizable subdivision, some excess of 500 homes. They had generated seven calls in the fiscal year of 2008. That was the comment I made. Well, I would think that where I live, and it, the calls have increased every year as we grow older. Uh, I've had five calls at my house in the last six months, so I know how many uh, will show up. Um, 
maintenance costs, you, you said something about $200 a month. We are trying to keep our homeowners association dues at approximately $200 a month per home so that you, the homeowner, are paying about $200 a month. Well, let me tell you, that won't, that won't stand over the years. May not. Uh, ours were low when we moved in. They increase just about every year. Um, that's my questions for right now, Ken. Thanks. Okay. Who else? Uh, okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. How many people in the public want to speak to this issue? Raise your hands. Okay. We've got quite a quite a few. I'm going to restrict it to three minutes a person, unless like there's a representative from the MAC that represents the, you know, speaking as representing the MAC would like to get up and speak. But otherwise, try to keep it within three minutes. The way to do that, if you agree with what the last person said, just say I agree with the last person. Just try to bring new comments or new ideas to the commission. So if you just sort of queue up, give us your name and where you live and make your comments. Please don't don't hesitate. Everybody just sort of line up and. Uh, my name is John Taylor. Uh, I live on Swan Lake Drive, about a block and a half from the uh, enclave, uh, the proposed project here, and uh, uh, I, along with our neighbors, are very very concerned about the traffic situation there. We have massive massive traffic problems around the schools there, big time, and you just get in line, uh, and it's very and bringing additional cars in there is only going to make that worse. Uh, we're also concerned about the density change. It's totally different than what we're, what, why we moved there in the first place, and a lot of our neighbors feel the same way. Uh, we're very, very concerned about taking down these trees, uh, the cottonwood trees. Uh, certainly a few branches may fall. That's going to happen most anywhere. Uh, uh, very, very concerned about that. Uh, and I believe, in my opinion, maybe it's your job to be concerned more with our, our neighborhood and our county than with people that are 55 years and older and where they're going to live. Thank you. My name is Lisa Erickson and I live at 9819 Elmhurst Drive and I had a feeling my time was going to be limited so I wrote a letter and I'm hoping I can get through it in three minutes. Um, and I, I just want to say you had a question about the emergency response time. The fire department is actually located at Wellington and East Roseville Parkway. So in order to get to this development, they would have to drive through the school zone. And if you needed a call at 8 o'clock in the morning on Monday, good luck, because it's not going to happen in two minutes. The traffic is so congested there during the uh, school rush hours. But uh, I'm writing in regard to the project that is coming before you today. This is not the first letter or time that I've expressed my opinions regarding this project, but I sure hope it will be the last. This project has been a long time in the making and has had several lives before today. Several years ago, the project began as a subdivision up to, of up to 43 homes. That project did not generate enough positive response, so it then was reduced to 39 homes. That didn't fly, which then resulted in the retirement community concept. I've lived in the Sacramento area for the past 23 years, and my husband has lived in this area for the past 14 years. We spent a lot of time looking for a home for our family throughout the area. After searching for over a year, we finally decided that Granite Bay was where we belonged, and Elmhurst Drive was the street for us. My husband and I purchased our property in Granite Bay in 2003 and built our dream home that we plan on living in until our children grow old enough to leave us. We will retire in our home. We will grow old in our home. We love our home and we love the area in which we live. We <coughs> love the fact that we feel as though we're in the middle of nowhere, but really we're in the middle of everything. We did our homework and looked into the zoning of the remaining open, open lots around our area. We made plans based on that research. Why is it so terrible to think that six other families just like mine will have an opportunity to buy a wonderful plot of land and build their dream home on their dream property? The developer, Pasture Land Development, will have you believe that Granite Bay doesn't need to have more mansions, as they call them. It seems as though they would like me to feel bad for the wonderful home that I've created for my three sons. 
Why is that a bad thing? Mr. Pastor spoke at the MAC meeting when this project was presented as an action item and unanimously denied by the committee members. He spoke about his passion. He expressed that he is passionate about this project. Well, Mr. Pastor and I have that trait in common. I am passionate about what I feel I've created for my family, and I believe I speak on behalf of many of the families that live in my neighborhood. That is why I'm here today. As the planning department explained in their report, there were many comments received regarding this project. Many of those comments in opposition of this project were from my neighbors. We are the people that would, meet, okay. would be most directly affected by this development of 27 homes. In fact, every family that has children attending the two elementary schools, Oak Hills and Ridgeview, will okay. be affected okay. by okay. these additional you're, homes. Okay, your time, time's up. Can I just say one more thing? Yeah, me? just make it a bullet point. If okay. you guys, instead of going into a lot of detail, give us bullet points. Okay. You say, hey, traffic's bad you know, at the school, we understand that. I think it's unfortunate that the planning department has left a door open and tied this to the community plan review. I've submitted a land use request change to keep the zoning current for these uh, lots. And I've also uh, submitted a land re use request change for the parcel that the trees are on. Those requests have not been made public, so I'd like to provide a copy of the letter and those land use change requests to, to you. you. You can give it to Kathy. And she okay. Thank you for your time. I, just, <laughs> okay. Come on up. Try to keep it in the, the three minutes. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Richard Doss. I live at 9800 Beckingham, which is directly across the street. It's actually on the corner of Swan Lake, Elmhurst, and Beckingham. I've been there 11 years and I've noticed some things about the traffic. Uh, cars come down the hill really fast. CHP writes tickets all the time down there. They wrote eight tickets one time in an hour and a half when I watched. Uh, I have three kids going to Ridgeview and Oak Hills next year. Do you all have grandkids or children going there? Probably not. Well, I'm really concerned because people speed, they run the stop sign, and the kids actually come down the hill on their bikes and scooters to go to school to come really fast and they shoot through that intersection on the right-hand side. You put that street through, someone's gonna get seriously injured or killed. And I'm, I'm giving you a heads up way ahead of time. That needs to be a court. As far as the tree, removing the tree, the tree just needs maintenance. It's the main part of that riparian zone. Keeps that whole creek area cool. Many different birds uh, use the tree. Um, I just want to say that I, I don't really have any problem with the pastors developing their land. They're good people. They have a right to develop their land, but maybe six, eight, ten homes tops. That's what should go in there, and uh, then everybody's going to be safe. The kids aren't going to get hurt. Nobody's going to get run over there, but I'm, I'm warning you, someone's going to get run over there. Someone's going to shoot that intersection. They're going to roll it. Some kid coming down the hill is going to get hit, so you're warned. Hi, Commissioners. Uh, my name is John Milburn. I live at 5030 Linda Creek, which is that small little court right at the bottom of the image there. So I'm right next door to this project. I'm also an architect, and I want to make just a few comments about um, this project. Um, I, too, have children that two children that go to Ridgeview are going to be attending Ridgeview for the next three years. And we use Elmhurst. That's the path of travel, the con uh, traffic concerns, notwithstanding the spin that uh, age-restricted housing somehow creates less traffic, which I think is uh, a statistical issue, not a reality uh, concern here. Um, I am concerned about the traffic. So I see that any connection of this project to Elmhurst is going to uh, have the most negative impacts, particularly if the, tr if the street doesn't go through, then the trees don't have to come out. If the trees don't have to come out, we're not building a road in a, in a protected wet in a wetlands area. Okay. A lot of the uh, uh, environmental concerns outlined in the uh, environmental impact report described erosion <coughs> concerns and uh, flooding concerns, all brought about by the act of trying to build a road over wetlands. So stop the road from going through, you solve a lot of problems. Traffic, you solve a lot of traffic problems as well. Um, as an architect, I totally appreciate Mr. Demure's concepts. I think I really agree with that. But this project, if you zoom out a little bit in your, in your aerial, you'll see that this is a tiny pocket of land 
it's not that accessible to, it, it might be walkable, but it's to where? There's no walk, there's no, not a walking neighborhood in that sense. Um, services are very far away for people that might need uh, services that are 55 and older and aging, uh, an aging population. The biggest concern or land use mix up in this particular project is where I live, I can hear the 400, 600 students playing at recess time and it's loud. The mitigation for that noise was just simply to notify the potential buyers of these properties that they were going to be in a noisy area. Families with kids want to live close to school. That's why we moved to where we live. We want our kids to walk to school. This property is for families with children that are going to go to this school, not for families that don't have children or actually excluding families with children. Um, I could say a lot more, but uh, lastly, I'll say one, I'll take a little, couple more seconds. Design-wise, 27 lots on 12 acres. Um, if you look at the layout, you'll see that all the property lines align. I mean, it's compact. It's a very compact plan. One-story units, they, I don't know where the visual interest is there, uh, but they're all basically going to be garage-centered spaces. I, I agree with the one-storiness of them, but the lots are, six, are 60 feet wide, roughly. The average lot is uh, 9,300 square feet. The smallest lot proposes, I think, 5,300 square feet. If you look, just quickly, if you look at these, talking about uh, mansions, you'd put a 3,500 square foot house on a 17,000 foot lot, which is roughly what's around that area compared, and that's a 20% coverage. You put a 2,600 square foot house on a 9,000 square foot lot, that's a 40% coverage. As far as density, this is way out of line with the neighboring properties. Thank you. Good morning, Sandy Harris, 5911 Riva Drive, Granite Bay. I've lived in the community 32 years. We built our house so we could stay there. I cut my grass, I live on two and a half acres. These houses are all bigger than the house I'm living in. It wouldn't be downsizing at all. But I'm here to speak for the Granite Bay Community Association. We support the development of this property, but it's the wrong project in the wrong area. There is no evidence that Granite Bay is deficient in meeting the long-term needs of the community. That this project meets any identified problems in the plan or provides a benefit to the community. A, high, a number of high-density projects have been approved for development in appropriate zoned areas of our community. We've just approved several duplex projects, and there's a duplex project in uh, Tree Lake on Village Center. In 1989, when the plan was in the development stage, a petition was submitted by residents south of Eureka Road requesting a density change of two units per acre, and the pastors were part of this petition. At that time, staff recommended that the present general plan designations of RR and Ag Residential remain on the property in the area based on existing residential patterns, and that is how the area has developed. When the plan was adopted, there were about 6,000 residents in Granite Bay. Now there are 17,000 which means about 11,000 newcomers liked what they saw and bought into our plan as it was adopted. We like the variety of lifestyles offered by our plan, and it would be unfair to change the zoning on this last remaining infill property, which is surrounded by parcels that have developed as zoned. In fact, under this new um, review of our plan, there have only been 49 requests for rezoning out of 8,500 parcels. So I think that's a pretty good evidence that people like our community the way it is. The request for higher density is a conflict with surrounding homes and has no benefit for the community. The general plan amendment necessary to obtain the density requested is a conflict with many of the goals and policies of the Granite Bay Community Plan. Over the years, proponent has submitted many concepts to the county, MAC, and GBCA. In all cases, a much higher density than allowed has been proposed, and there has been no support. Nothing has changed. This is still an attempt for higher density at the expense of the Granite Bay Community Plan and the immediate neighborhood. This project does not merit a general plan amendment. The GBCA supports MAC, the staff, and recommends denial of a general plan amendment. Thank you. I'm Claudia Doyle. I live at 8122 Quartzsite Circle, which is on the north side of Eureka. I walk through this area. I'm basically a me too, but one of the things that was brought up is not having access out onto Elmhurst for this project. And 
There's been a, a little bit of talk about the access going out on, um, what's the other street, Skyview. Um, Eureka is a mess during commute times. And we have put three stop signs in there over the last 10 years along the whole length of it. But that too has a lot of heavy traffic on it. Um, other than that, I walk through there, I see the traffic, I see the problems it could be. Also, the pictures that you showed a while back, which were very good, did not include the uh, eight, six or eight foot um, fence that's gone up around the pasture property. So that's been an interesting, um, we call it a spike fence, but anyway, thank you very much. Hi, I'm Ron Sturm, and I want to speak on behalf of this property. My dad has had property in Granite Bay. He's got five acres, and he's 80 years old, and he mows every day. And he's like, he mentioned as active as he's been all of his life, he's already starting to say, you know, I, I think I need to get something smaller, something more that I could use. And he thought about, you know, selling his property, and something like this, you've got a lot of people in Granite Bay that have homes that are, are hard for them to use as they <coughs> get older. And I think this project should go on. This is a project I think we need here. I mean, I'd, I'd hate to have to change the license plate instead of, you know, stay and play. In Granite Bay, it looks like it's going to be stay away from Granite Bay. I mean, I, I just, it's not, you got to think about that. That's all I want to say. My name is Kurt Churvis. I live in uh, Swan Lake. Uh, my house backs to that. Um, there's a lot of passion here, uh, a lot of people concerned about where it's going. I'm a civil engineer. I do a lot of development for large companies from Colorado, Hawaii. Uh, I'm just going to talk bullets, like the man said, technically uh, tr um, traffic. Uh, it's a super elevated curve if anybody's going out there. What that means is you can't see that intersection. You can't see coming around that turn there. Um, I would like you to go out there when school starts. Look at the kids coming through. Go to the police station, the highway patrol, and say how many tickets have been written there. That's the technical stuff. Other technical stuff is everybody's decaying. The trees are decaying every day. We are. Um, to use that argument that the trees decaying is ridiculous. It's a riparian area. It'll die, other trees grow through there, um, that tree has been there for, since I've been there. I got pictures of it. Um, is not decaying. It's a historical monument. You have to change the rule to change that. The second thing, the third thing they said is they're going to want to do that interchange. They have to buy some property from somebody. So now we're doing changes again. I don't mind changes. However, there's rules. And if you want to change the rules in the middle of the game, then that's what you have to do. But keep the rules the same when this, uh, a development comes in and your answers will be solid. There will always be passions on both sides, so we're never going to be able to argue that. So please look at the technical things. Number one, the repairing area. Did they do the 404 permit for the Army Corps? Did they find out what the impact of the flood is? Did they figure out how many trees are going to rip and how the repairing is actually going to be destroyed? Because that's the major area where the tree shade is for that repairing area. I got pictures in 2001 where they were actually cutting down the wetlands. I went out there, physically asked the lawnmower guy, you are in violation of a 404 going into wetlands, and he ignored me and continued uh, mowing and stuff like that. I have pictures of that. It's a continuation of violations. That's what I want to talk about. Look at the technical ability. You guys will be able to answer that. You're never going to please everybody in their passion, and I appreciate your time. Good morning. My name is Randy Pastor. I live at 9819 Cranley Drive in Granite Bay. You'll notice my last name is Pastor. I have no affiliation with Pastor Land Development. I have no interest in it whatsoever. I am a proud member of the Pastor family, though. I built my house in Granite Bay in 1994 in the Trade Village subdivision, which this is accessed off of by Elmhurst Drive. When we moved in, Tree Lake Village, before I moved in, before Tree Lake Village was developed, Hundreds of acres of wide open space. When Tree Lake Village was proposed, I'm positive there was adjoining neighbors that said, absolutely not, not in my backyard. If you look at Tree Lake Village now, beautiful development. 
I take my hat off to the Lust Corporation, the Moss family, and Leona Pastor who developed it in the first phase. Excellent place to live. I've raised my children there. They've attended Oak Hills, they've attended Ridgeview, and they've attended Granite Bay High School. My youngest just graduated this year from Granite Bay. Unfortunately, I'm in that, in that demographic of group that says I have a big house in Granite Bay, I have a pool, I have a big yard. My children are leaving my home. My oldest has moved out, my youngest is going away to college. I would like to stay in Granite Bay. I've lived there, I built my house myself. Our roots are set in Granite Bay. I don't want to be forced to somewhere else, but then again, my home is a family home. It's not suiting my wife and myself, who's only there right now. Things have been said about developers as being the great white Satan, you know, coming to pillage the land. This land was 24 acres that was purchased by my grandmother, who's passed away, back in 1974, when the Granite Bay Community Plan did not exist. It was the Lumens Basin Plan that was adopted in 1975. The family has suffered changes throughout the course of time. Time has happened where in, in the middle 80s, a portion, a portion of this 25 acres was allowed to come into Trail Lake Village as, as part of the development. The other portion of it was left for future development. Always, always intended a future development. Now you have people who, Linda Creek Court was developed by the Pastor family. They're living there now saying, now that I'm here, nobody else come. Everybody else go away. That's not right. The development needs to happen on this piece of property. If you look at the map, there's lower density behind it, medium density to the right, medium density to the left. This portion of ground comes in, makes a notch, goes back out, and they're saying it's 2.3 acres. Someone on a map somewhere, when they were setting up this line, drew a line along a creek line, saying that was a natural barrier, cutting somebody's property in half, saying half of it can be developed is high density, half that has to be left is 2.3. That wasn't fair. They needed to go along the property line. Back to that map that had purple and purple, that would make sense. I'm in favor of development in Granite Bay. You smart girls, it's your guys' job to do that. Make sure every, you'll never make everybody happy. Do your best. Good morning, my name is Chuck Hughes. I'm with Sycamore Environmental Consultants. Um, I'm an arborist and I took a look at the uh, cottonwood tree in question on the property at the road access point. Uh, about a year and a half ago, we put it through a, a standard um, evaluation procedure. It's called the tree hazard evaluation form. Uh, it results in what's effectively a risk index, uh, if you will, for the tree. Uh, the, the range goes from a three to 12. Uh, with three being the safest possible tree and 12 being the most dangerous possible tree, uh, the tree got a nine. Um, there's no magic number at which you remove a tree. It's simply a matter of we live with risk and whoever owns the tree or whoever's in charge of the tree, whether or not they want to remove it or not with that uh, given general index number. Um, because the tree uh, does have special designation by the county, we recommended an aerial inspection of the, of the uh, canopy and that was done by Mr. Randall Frizzell. Uh, he's a well-known local arborist. He's, he's worked on the, the tree that uh, Camille mentioned in Miller Park that killed a man a couple years ago and he's worked on the Robert E. Lee tree uh, in Sequoia National Park. Um, his recommendation was uh, that the tree should be removed immediately due to a lot of decay he saw in the limbs in the upper canopy that was not visible from the ground. Uh, based on the results of his aerial inspection of the canopy, we would uh, today give the tree uh, a number 10 out of 12, um, and that's under the existing conditions. Uh, I just wanted to mention that when uh, Camille uh, brought the design plan to us and we first looked at it, clearly they had put a median there to uh, preserve the tree, uh, but it was our uh, conclusion that the tree would not be safe at all <laughs> if you went in and disturbed that much of the root zone, uh, even with the median there, and, and you couldn't really move the road due to uh, circulation concerns with the intersection and so forth. Um, the county, after uh, getting uh, our letter and Mr. Frizzell's, had it uh, peer-reviewed by uh, uh, another consulting firm. Uh, so I just wanted to mention a couple of bullet points from that other consulting firm. So for everybody in the room, uh, these are not my words. These are the arborists' words that the county hired. Um, they said, to reduce the hazard potential from these trees on the surrounding targets, this is under existing conditions, and to improve the overall structure of these trees, several actions would need to be taken. 
Trees should be pruned to remove all existing dead wood and decaying limbs to reduce end weight and ultimately improve its overall structure. The three large branches that overhang Elmhurst Drive and the adjacent sidewalk should either be completely removed, pruned back, cabled using, utilizing a non-invasive type of system or a combination of these and other measures to reduce the risk they pose. Fencing should be placed along the sidewalk edge and around the extent of the remaining tree canopy with exclusionary signs, i.e., quote, Placer County designated landmark cottonwood tree, area use prohibited for safety reasons. Once again, I just want to mention that's existing conditions and that they also said that they concurred with our conclusion that if the road went in, uh, you'd be removing too much of the uh, root system too destabilizing to the tree, and they concurred with our recommendation. Thank you. Okay, is anyone else wanting to speak on this? Neil, I'll give you When it's appropriate, I would like to address some of the traffic comments because we didn't really dwell on that. Whenever staff can address it or I can address it, either one. Oh, okay. You go, go ahead and okay. we might have some we just, questions to staff. Bear with me for a second here. Oh, this is, this is your presentation, huh? Can we jump to the traffic page? I'm sorry. Just a, a couple of points to clarify. Um, there's no through connection to Skyview Lane. It's an emergency access only connection. I'm not sure if it was you, Commissioner Crabb, or someone had mentioned there will be no through traffic, but there'll be a crash gate, which doesn't exist right now. For fire. Trip uh, generation is down. Oh, I need right. There's a table on one. Generation grid existing. Yeah. Uh huh. Thank you. Is it Camille? Yes. Um, Skyview is is a road that goes out to the what the north. East, north. Mm -hmm. But there will be a connection between Pasture and uh, Elmhurst. Elmhurst. Public that road. Will, that'll be a public road that will That's be developed correct. with this project. That's correct. Okay. Right. But right where a pastor touches the edge of the site, there'll be an emergency access only to Skyview, which doesn't exist right now. So those people way at the end of pastor court, stole wood, in the, in the case of an emergency, could get out to Eureka without coming way back through the subdivision out to Elmhurst. And um, fire equipment would be able to. Right. And that was South Placer Fire was delighted about that because they've always been concerned about that area. Um, we didn't dwell on this for any great length of time, and I won't at this point in time. You have in front of you the staff's evaluation of the environmental impacts, and as you heard EJ say earlier, there are no adverse environmental impacts that are unmitigatable or unavoidable. So I didn't really dwell on this in the interest of time, because there's so many of us here. But we did voluntarily a traffic analysis. The staff didn't require us to do one, because we don't trip any thresholds to do one, but we felt it was prudent to do one. And although this table shows 29 dwelling units and eight, the staff has corrected us. There's six available now, and we've proposed 27. So relatively speaking, these numbers are completely accurate. The bottom line to this whole is because we are proposing senior homes, traffic is less. Obviously, Harry, you know that in terms of the actual number of trips that you go in and out of your home per day versus what a family home generates. And these are not my numbers, but these are statistics that are developed by the Institution of Traffic Engineers. And you'll see in that first column where it says, come on, come back. There's my little dot. All right. There it is. 3.7 trips per day for an age-restricted community versus 9.57 trips a day. Those are national averages, state averages, based upon actual developments. That's what staff uses to evaluate the traffic impact. At the end of the day, the difference between what we're proposing and what could be developed under the existing zoning is zip. There is no difference because the trip generation is so much less. That is one of the additional or collateral benefits to what we're proposing. We recognize that there are peak hour impacts from the schools in the morning and in the afternoon. Absolutely. All the more reason to develop homes where people can choose the time of day they go in and out to the market. They don't have to get in their car at 8 to get to work. They don't have to come home at 5. So that's the whole benefit of having what we are proposing, to counterbalance what's happening there in terms of traffic. And I can answer any questions along those lines. 
Um, we also heard briefly there's impacts to the riparian zone. Rebecca probably can address this as well. There are no impacts to the riparian areas. We have a bridge structure crossing the wetlands area, and there's absolutely no diminution of wetlands area on the property, not one ounce. And that's indicated in the environmental document. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, hey, with that, I'll go ahead and bring it back to the commission for discussion. Okay, I do have a question for Rebecca. Uh, there was reference to um, uh, poor sight distance, I think, where Elm and the proposed uh, Swan Lake Drive would come together. Right. How is how is engineering in the county viewed that? That's a stop controlled intersection, and the new connection for Elmhurst would also be a stop. It'd be a four way stop. Um, it's, it operates at an acceptable level of service. It's and it would in the future with the if, if this were to pass, would it still? Right, it'd be a four-way stop controlled, and if need be, you could have warnings, um, you know, approaching stop, but it traffic slows at this point to stop. I, I, I have a question because I have been out on site. I've, I've looked at it, and, and I noticed there wasn't a traffic problem. In fact, everything I heard today has to do with the school do, during school times when everybody's in a hurry to get their kids to school. And I was wondering, other than stop signs, or there has the county thought whether this goes through or not, other traffic calming devices, bump outs. Because one thing I noticed in a lot of the newer engineering in the higher density areas, they sort of bring the roads down. Where it slows down, they, they have, you know, bump outs, they be at a table, other, other things, even, you know, uh, a roundabout, something that just sort of physically when a person comes up, if it's a stop sign, especially out there, I tend to agree with the one gentleman whether this went in or not, somebody will probably get hit because it looks like a raceway when I was out there, the road is so, so wide, the existing roadway. And I don't see a lot of traffic calming, just the stop signs. Is the county looked at something that would impede traffic where it's not just a sign that would slow them down, but just uh, physical barriers? Um, to my knowledge, there, there hasn't been a, a request or um, any ongoing um, project to look at uh, neighborhood traffic calming in this area. Um, that, that might be something the Department of Public Works would be looking at, however. They do have a neighborhood traffic calming um, program, and uh, that's actually approved by the board. It's on the web page. And at any time, somebody that has a concern, the public, can contact the Department of Public Works um, to discuss potential, uh, especially you know, for public roads, which these are, potential traffic calming and an engineer from DPW would begin looking at it. So there are options. Um, this development in itself uh, isn't required to do a mitigation of, of some kind of, um, for the traffic that's being proposed, it's a slight increase over what today's zoning would allow, but um, that doesn't trigger that they have to mitigate the existing traffic issues. Okay. Thank you. A couple questions, Ken. Uh, as staff, excuse me, um, the 404 permit was men mentioned. Is anybody doing anything about that or is it even necessary? Yeah, we, we didn't talk in detail about the mitigated negative declaration, but, but those are all part of the mitigation measures that they would have to comply with all state and federal permits and uh and and you know mitigate impacts to the you know wetlands and and waterway that goes through there so they can't proceed with that anything until they get those permits right ej yeah if if if, if, if you know the commission decided to move forward with this you know we would we would come back with conditions so you can see those actual conditions okay a comment was made about trips per day again um 
you're talking about a national average when you talk about trips per day. I think that that should be studied by area, not nationwide. Uh, certainly, there are more trips per day in Del Webb and Lincoln and Del Webb Roseville. Uh, my experience with my neighbors is that they certainly go more than three times a day. I go more than three times a day. So, okay. Any? Thanks, Ken. Okay. Um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll just sort of well, let me, uh, go, go ahead, Rich. Yeah. You know, there was a discussion about the fact that uh, there was an easement for uh, what is proposed to be yeah. Swan Lake Drive that existed before the uh, cottonwood tree was designated as a historic, or a, what, what do you call it, a, uh, yeah, historic tree, I guess. Specimen tree, yeah. Specimen tree. And so I guess kind of question, you know, who takes press preference on uh, on this, you know, if somebody had a plan there and an easement that existed, and then Whether it's six lots or yeah, and then the one. county comes in and says this is a heritage tree, uh, does that kind of wipe out the easement rights to go with that proposal? Yeah, um, this land, what's considered, I think, a landmark tree under the county's tree ordinance, Scott Friendly, Deputy County Counsel here. Um, the board uh, designated this a landmark tree based upon the circumstances at the time. It's unclear the extent to which there was a discussion about the fact it's located within this future designated right of way, the extent to which that was actually taken into account at that time. Um, so, uh, but nonetheless, because this project does propose to remove those trees, they would need to get a tree permit and they would need to provide the justification in order for the Board of Supervisors ultimately to remove that la landmark designation. So it's, it's just another component of the tree, but it, in, in 2001 when this was designated, this appears to have already been des an area where the right-of-way was known. Um, but again, because there was no formal development at that time, I, I suspect what they said is, is uh, we don't know whether or not it will ultimately need to be removed to develop the properties. Okay, so, so it could be removed. It, it could Irre be. Regardless of whether it's healthy or not, depending upon a uh, judgment on the part of the Board of Supervisors. Correct. Okay. Let me see, uh, I guess uh, another question that kind of, uh, comes up for me is, uh, at least in, I have experience with fires and have seen similar issues where, you know, you have neighborhoods that kind of have cul-de-sacs, but you also, uh, when you have emergencies, you know, circulation seems to be a, a valuable thing. You know, I mean, the fire department can come in this way or they can come in this way. And, and where you have blocked off streets, you know, it creates a problem sometimes time-wise or confusion-wise for uh, those emergency access. And so, I don't know, uh, maybe from the county perspective, maybe there's not a difference, but it seems to me that the circulation that we provided in this proposal, not that, I mean, we're not looking at the tentative map today, but uh, just maybe you could address circulation versus not circulation, the benefits to a community. And I guess that's directed to Rebecca. Sure. Um, you know, we, engineering and surveying, we, we look to the fire department to review projects as far as emergency response and, and their times to respond or their, you know, the best route um, or to get people in and out if, there's an emergency and how do you, you get people to evacuate an area. Um, in this case, Bob Richardson from South Placer Fire reviewed the project, was very comfortable with the design, um, had a letter with some conditions, but, but was definitely uh, supportive of this looped configuration with the full access, um, Swan Lake and Pasture Drive, and then the EVA to the north. So the fire department was was happy with this design. Okay, thank you. Okay, I guess I'll, I'll just sort of jump in and put my perspective and my, my feelings um, for it. I honestly like the concept. I went out, I looked at the site, I, I have listened to all the concerns of, of the 
the people before us and even the issue with the Mac and, and it always boils down to its its traffic and then its density but when you go out there and you look if you look at this and you had it in place on that map with all the trees around it it's not a big visual impact and then also it does bring some things to the table that the existing people really want I mean there was a one of the people that came up and commented has, well, I don't like the fence around it right now because I walk out there every day. If you did make it six lots and put six homes out there, the people are probably going to fence in their property and you're not going to, you're not going to have any access to it because the houses in that area aren't like some of the rural more agricultural or farm type construction in Granite Bay, some of the older stuff. All the new stuff out there is at that at the time that it was developed was sort of state of the art, the newest thing. And the direction we're moving is to compact development, trying to keep open space around it. And there aren't the services for seniors out there. And I know if I lived out in Granite Bay, even at my age, I'm looking for the single story house. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I like the concept. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that most people that move out there because they like to travel, they like to be close to another home. So that way, if you lock up your home and you go traveling, you know that the person on each side of you is going to keep an eye, uh, eye on your property. For services out there, when you talk, be it fire service and everything, because of the fire station, you do have the, the immediate response sounds like in timing. It's actually better than probably it is in Roseville at Del Webb because it's a four, you know, Roseville's four minute time, time limit. And then the, the biggest thing that I saw out there was the issue with the school. The whole time I was out there, there wasn't a lot of traffic that I saw, but the traffic I saw, they, you know, it was a road race. And you look at the roads, they're just so wide coming down off the hill, every, you know, everybody's racing. And I just didn't see a lot of traffic calming devices that you see in other communities or, you know, more modern stuff that would slow the traffic down. So personally, I feel, you know, it is a good project whether it moved ahead here or if they put it into the plan for, for later, you know, look, see, you know, I think think being an infill project it's it works out so that's sort of my my two cents worth and whether it moves forward or or not I do think that the community needs to pursue some traffic calming devices out there yeah maybe I could add on to that because I agree with I think what you're saying but basically it seems like the element uh, of issue here is the the interim adjustments to the community plan that are proposed here and and of course you know I guess at the Planning Commission we uh, we do see and we have seen some very major proposed adjustments to the community plan that have uh, gone through the process and uh, where they were well developed proposals and uh, you know took into account the bigger picture than it was uh, fairly okay, it was okay to approve those in other cases where it looked like it was just kind of a thumb sticking out in the middle of a uh, rice field, that wouldn't work very well. Uh, in this case, uh, at least when I drive through the area, it is, it does appear, it's a very nice neighborhood, you know, I, I was very impressed with the neighbor down the neighborhood down there and kind of wish my neighborhood looked like that. It does in part, but it does uh, have a very uh, residential appearance to it. And, uh, you know, I, I agree that looking at the open spaces proposed in this project, uh, 
I don't believe that this is going to look like a high density neighborhood. Uh, you know, it'll still have much of the rural appearance to it. And uh, you know, I know I live in a neighborhood where we have quarter acre lots, and we also have a grade school in that neighborhood. And it has been issues, and some of the same issues have come up when other when proposals have been made to open up streets and that kind of thing. But uh, you know, I I don't hear uh, issues in relationship to the neighborhood I live in that would be. A, which would be a very high density neighborhood. So at any rate, uh, I also am concerned that uh, you know this uh, proposal has been in the mill for a long time, and it appears that there's been a lot of negotiation, discussion, at least thoughts to mitigate it. And uh, you know I can see the, the value of waiting for the community plan, and I think that this issue needs to be continued into the community plan because this is definitely a discussion that the uh, Granite Bay community needs to have. But at this point in time, uh, to ask the developer to delay the proposal uh, as far as it's gone, it seems like uh, unless there was some major problem uh, and it appears to be an infill site, you know, I, I think I would be in favor of at least presenting this to the Board of Supervisors to uh, allow them to make consideration on it as as a uh, zoning change. Chairman? Um, yeah, go ahead. I had the opportunity to sit through the, the MAC meetings while this was going on and hear the comments. Okay, is that better? You got to turn your mic off. I think it's on. Oh, just oh, press this. Is that better? Okay, I sat through the, the MAC meetings and, and listened to some of the comments. Um, one thing that, that is just an interesting point to point out is that um, to many of the, the Tree Lake residents and the neighbors in there, um, many of the comments that they've made regarding the pasture development, the same comments were made by their neighbors when their property was developed. Um, change is a scary thing for everybody unknown factors, unanswered questions involved in that change, um, I think can put the fear into to a whole neighborhood, a whole community. Um, the fact that the existing residents are not obeying the speed limit and are not the most courteous drivers in Drown, um, I think is an enforcement issue. I don't think it's grounds for the pastors not to develop their property either. Um, I, I think that there's a, a, you know, a timing issue, as was said, with regards to the community plan update being processed through and then this running alongside of it that, again, I think accelerates that, that fear factor among some of the other neighbors and, and that um, it is a, a significant increase in density. Um, I understand as some of the neighboring property owners count the number of new lots that will be in their backyard compared to what existing zoning would offer. I understand that that could initially create some, some good fears and concerns going from the possibility of one neighbor to five. Um, Again, just kind of making comments here. The average size home, I think, that's been built in South Placer in the last few years pushes 6,000 square feet. I think the imposition of several large homes, half a dozen large homes built there, two stories, grandiose structures that they would have to be to support the lot prices, um, would probably wind up being more intrusion into the neighbors visual shed or whatever you want to call it than, than with these. Um, I guess, um, so I, I'm not entirely sure how I feel about the whole thing, but those are just some of the comments and I guess maybe I'm looking, some of you guys have been doing this longer than me for some bits. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> That's bad news. Uh, Paul. What do you see as the time frame for the update of this community plan? So I should defer to EJ. I think he's put more. EJ, I'm sorry. 
Well, uh, originally when we started this process, the uh, pretty ambitious time schedule was given uh, of two years from the time we started it this last January. Uh, given the, uh, the current economic condition and status of, uh, of the county, I, I see this uh, you know, being prolonged for some time. We just uh, completed a six month uh, review period or open time period where uh, residents can submit requests for land use changes uh, and policy changes. That just ended. Uh, uh, I don't expect community meetings to actually begin until sometime this fall. So th th this could be, you know, a, a, you know, a long process. Uh, definitely not as long as uh, Forest Hill, <laughs> that community plan. But uh, you know, I, I would say, you know, from this point, we're we're looking at, you know, over two years. At least a year, two years. Two, two years. And if it's, well, yeah. I, I guess that's probably the biggest struggle I'm having. I, uh, it's pretty so, obvious yeah. that. Uh, Developers looking to whatever the market will allow him to sell, and I, I'm sure this is a market-driven decision on their part. I can't blame him for that, it's particularly when the market's so sour right now. But I also am struggling a little bit because I do, <laughs> I do think back about the time in the uh, early 70s when we heard the original Loomis Basin General Plan, and I'm afraid I might be the only one here that was there then. And I, uh, we, we had the same quandary, you know, what kind of a community did we want to see develop there and what was, what was the outcome? And, and, it, and, you know, it started out talking about quarter acre lots or 10,000 square foot lots, and then finally we said, well, if that's not good for the county or good for the region, We'd be better off if we had larger parcels that maybe it would develop a little slower and a little more subtly. Well, so we went with the larger parcels, the two and a half acres and five acres and ten acres in the Lewis Basin. Well, it was exactly what the public was looking for. They wanted exactly those those types of situations. They were the, that was the kind of community they wanted to live in. And Granite Bay caught on fire, and it became the community to to move to. And and I guess we sort of accidentally created this monster. Uh, and now the people that went there for the reasons that were obvious, they, they wanted a, a laid back community, they're fighting to maintain it, I guess. And they see this as probably not exactly what they had in mind when they got there. And so I'm torn because I think the project is a good project. I basically think it's a great idea. I think it's the kind of thing we need to, for infill, we need to try to keep open space around smaller spaces. Uh, it's pretty obvious that the economy is telling us that's the kind of thing we need to think more about in the future and to develop that, uh, what remaining land we have in that fashion. But it's still a, a hard decision to essentially have promised the community this is what we're going to, this is the way it's going to look for the foreseeable future, and and we are changing the face a little bit. While it doesn't, you know, it's not going to really show much, or it's not going to have a major impact on any one or two people. It's it is the wave of the future, and it is what we're looking at as a uh, a way that we're going to have to deal with infill because there's just not enough land to, for everyone to have their five acre parcel. So some people are going to have to live on. Um, more economical <coughs> sized parcels. But the people that are already there don't want, want it in their backyard, and I can understand that, you know? And so it's, it's a dilemma. Well, it's a shame because it's, a, it's the kind of development that probably today might be marketable, if anything is. And, and it might be the kind of thing we need to look at. Uh, and I guess my first feeling would be maybe what we should do is bifurcate the, the application and send the, the zoning request on to the Board of Supervisors, see if that flies, and then come back and deal with the project separately at a later time so that if the Board's then willing to make that change in the zoning that it's going to take in the general plan, then we can look at the project in, in, in as consistent. But that's kind of a punishment in a sense. Yeah, but, yeah. I, but I, it's just I, honestly, I guess my my feeling would be I'd rather see us voted 
up or down because they've they've been going through this process prior to looking at the general plan and if it's going to be another couple of years and they're wanting to go I I don't know if if that would you know would be fair to the applicant I have a I mean sick, what it's it can uh, just clarification by up or down do you mean uh, uh, not bifurcating but just going forward with uh, approval of conditions and tentative map today too yeah because then but if, if I might mr. chairman just just so we know what we're dealing with here the recommendation of staff is for denial but the actual project the conditions have not been before you brought before you today because they're bringing it for denial on the basis of inconsistency with the general plan and inconsistency with the zoning if your inclination is to support the project because you support the, the new general plan designation and the rezoning then I'd recommend you move to refer it back to staff for 30 days it'll be brought back to, before you in a complete package for approval and then that would go up to the board as a complete package if you don't support the general plan designation and land use you can approve the staff recommendation today and that denial would then go to the Board of Supervisors so those are those are kind of the two ways to, to go about it here today I have a question also and Camille maybe you can answer this do you also have a request in for the community plan update we did. you did so so in other words the whole project really isn't before you here today because it's really to get the issue of the general plan amendment and rezone settled if you want to support that refer it back to staff for 30 days the entire project will verify the conditions with with the applicant I agree with and bring it before you as a package with all of the all of the findings for approval those aren't in the packet right now you don't have findings for approval they're only findings for denial Fine, findings so. okay can if I may then okay I would make the motion uh, pursuant to what was just said that we uh, remand us back to staff for a 30-day period to uh, bring forward the project uh, in its full context to the Commission so that we can uh, vote up or down at that time on the full project miss just a point of clarification we'd like to continue that to a date and time specific Kathy do you have another question chairman uh, what are we going to accomplish by holding it off for 30 days uh, well, it, it's it's just that they would bring it back with everything in the package where you could vote it up or down if if the is commission it? were to support current staff recommendation which is for denial you could you could move to support the staff recommendation and that denial will go to the Board of Supervisors if you wish to support the project and that is approve the rezoning then we'll take all of the whole project up there uh, right now you don't have the conditions to approve the project before you, okay. you only have the findings for the denial and that would be my motion uh, given the date that we're coming up with so August 13th at 10.05 to continue that's and then we just ask the uh, applicant if that date is acceptable to the applicant. This is my vacation by two days. Go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I need a second. I have a motion and a second. Do you have a second? second is to have a okay motion second. Roll call. Okay, we'll go ahead and do it on a roll call. Mr. Sevison. <laughs> Rascal. Uh, yes. Mr. Moss. No. Mr. Gray. No. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Crab. No. Mr. Brittenall is absent. Absent. Uh, Mr. Denial. Yes. It looks like. It's a three-three. <laughs> I think we have <laughs> Okay. It sounds like it was a three-three vote, which would be a. Uh, which denied. would the, the motion would then be denied because it did not have an affirmative vote so without a motion to continue you have a couple of options now the one thing you could do is continue it till you have a seventh member 
um, to break the tie, uh, if, if that's something that the Commission would consider. Um, the other thing is it sounds like if you do a motion to support staff recommendation of denial, you may end up with a 3-3 as well. Um, you might want to consider continuing it then till Mr. Uh, Retinol is, is available to, to, to break the tie. That's another option at this point. Well, I'll move that we don't continue it. Okay, then that motion would be to, to approve the staff recommendation. As is. Have a roll call, please. Well, get a second. Second. Okay, have a motion. Second. Roll call. Mr. Sedison. No. Mr. Moss. No. Mr. Gray. Yes. Mr. Johnson. We see the motion is that we don't continue it. The motion is to approve the staff recommendation for denial of the general plan okay, amendment no. rezoning. Uh, Mr. Crabb. Yes. Baptist, Mr. Denio? No. Motion carries. Motion carries. Motion carries. Four, two. When can we expect a seventh member to come back? Could, I, could you clarify the vote? It was, uh, it was four to two. Four to two. Okay. Mr. In which Gray, case, Mr. Crabb. Then the staff recommendation is approved, and this matter will proceed. No, it's not. No, no it's not. Two to four. Oh, it was two, two to, to four. Two I'm to sorry. Four. <laughs> That's why I wanted four. clarification. Yeah, four. Two eyes. Against. Four no's. Do we know when Jerry's going to be here? Uh, Jerry, not until the end of September. Ooh. Well, let me let me offer a suggestion that we that we either deny or approve the staff recommendation so that it can either be sent up voluntarily or sent up under appeal to the board for clarification of the zoning and let them wrestle with the same issue. They got the tree issue they also want to probably talk about at the same same time. And I don't really care whether we send it up under appeal or whether we send it up voluntarily. It just saves the applicant a few bucks if we send it up voluntarily. That's the only difference. And then we'll get back a project at some later time based on what they do. So if we, if we, so you're proposing then that we, uh, if we did not, if we, we could accept the staff recommendation, or we could propose that we uh, approve we the could, zoning. We could recommend approval of the of zoning the change. We yeah. can do either one, and then the results will probably be the same. The only difference is the applicant will have to pay for the appeal if we deny it. If we approve the recommend approval of the zoning, then they get a free ride to the board. Is that your motion? Well, it's got to be one or the other. Yes, I, I, <laughs> what is it? I, I just was giving everyone an opportunity to say if they had a preference as to which way we... Well, I would uh, make the motion then that we approve the zoning change. Okay. I'll second it. Okay. That gets it up to we'll, we'll go <laughs> roll call. Okay. But did, just so approve the zoning change, but again, to do that, to send it to the board, what we're recommending then, if you're doing that, then you'll be sending the zoning change to the board without the rest of the project. Yes. Okay, just so you're just sending a recommendation on the zoning. But, the maybe, general plan amendment. Maybe with that, with them to discuss the merit, I don't know, merits of the project, or I guess they really have to have the package. Well, if, if it's for a full approval, it's better to have the full package there so that then they can take the action to approve well, it. If you recommend denial on the staff level, it'll go up anyway. And then if you recommend back. denial when it goes to the Board of Supervisors, they'll consider the general plan amendment and the rezoning. If they wish to support that, then they would send direction to staff then to review the entire project and bring it back as a package. Well, they would still be without the information on the project, right? Without the conditions of approval or a environmental document before them to approve at that time. So yeah, they so wouldn't have a basis really to uh, consider the in, consider it the consider entire project. Project. No. Yeah. That's why they I, could give they could give direction to staff as to their intent. I, that's why I just rather send up the whole thing. You know, if they bring it back to us in thirty days with a package, then we could at least send them something they could review. Uh, 
Well, let me see. In our first uh, proposal, we, uh, we we were we were asking that the project come back, so we could vote on the full project. Correct. Your we first were saying, I guess, tentatively that. Some of us have voted yes on it. We were saying tentatively that we were in agreement with the project, but we weren't making the decision on the project. Correct. And so, uh, you know, if we maybe discuss this a little bit amongst us here, you know, with the, with the public watching us, uh, if we went with our first proposal for those that were reluctant to say, well, I really go with this project. Or I'm against it. Or against it. If it comes back, to, if we say, okay, well, let's stand it back, up, let's uh, continue it till the date that we talk, so that we can review the whole project and vote at that time up or down on the project. It doesn't mean that we've done that today. We just that, that's want to correct. look at it just, again. That, that's absolutely with correct. With the full sending it context. back to staff to bring forward a recommendation for approval at which time you would still have to take the formal action to adopt that recommendation. So we'd have the full opportunity to make the decision with all the information and the decision that we would make at that time would uh, go to the Board of Supervisors, either up or down, with the full package of information. So that they say have a full package of information. Correct. So I guess what I would do is, well, we didn't, do we have to vote on that previous? Uh, well, I yeah. guess I guess somebody could make a, another motion back. I mean, that it, it's pretty much up to the ones that voted no on it. I mean, if they'd rather see a full package, understanding that they're not approving the project, they're just approving the right to see all the information come back before us. And At this stage, you would not be approving the general plan amendment or the rezoning. You'd simply be referring back to staff for the full package with findings for recommendation included, which are not here today. Right. To me, that makes sense, because to send a, a, you know, something up there that really doesn't even have background information, uh, it seems like we're putting the supervisors in kind of an awkward position to... I mean, I've, I've always thought that our, our job is to send them a recommendation, but enough information where we're not just passing the buck. Yeah. And I just sort of feel... It would probably be easier the for them to re reconcile their decision in the end on the zoning change if they had the full package to as a consideration because then you can marry the two together mm -hmm. and see if there's if they feel there's the pros and cons. Well, and that might change big minds too. It could go either way, but yeah. I'm, I'm just saying it, it makes it easier to make a decision if you have the full picture rather than just part of it. You, you well, could I think your original motion might be appropriate. Okay, the original motion, but you, just you could amend the motion to direct staff to bring the matter back with findings for both approval and denial, but with the full packet for approval. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I, I would amend the motion to uh, to that wording. Second. I have a motion to second. Roll call. Mr. Sevison. Yes. Mr. Moss. Yes. Mr. Gray. Yes. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Crabb. No. Um, Mr. Denio. Yes. The motion carries. And that would be to continue it to the date certain of Ar August 17th at what time? August 13th. 13th. August 13th at 13th. So, so this matter is continued. It would not be re-noticed. It will be simply continued to that date. Staff will come back with the full packet with findings for both approval and denial. Okay. okay. I guess my question is why didn't we have the full packet today then? Because it was staying. We shouldn't be in my mind judging this today then. We should have had the full packet. Well, they, we're just delaying everything they, now. Well, you don't get the full packet. I understand. Staff that. recommends denial. That's, that's the problem. Yeah. That's, I don't know how you get there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Let's have a break. So, if everybody can come back the 13th, we'll see it. Oh yeah. Hot 10. 10:05. And thank you for your patience. Okay, we'll take a, a real quick break here and get back to our final. Oh, oh. Uh, okay, I want you to go party for me. Go in there and go party for me.
So you can make it, give a, at least you can get I remember when I moved into that place in Miami, because it was, I had no shade, and I had to go in the house and another car. So it's like this can't fit in balance, you just have to keep doing it. To find a brick pad. With that, Set. I'm on. Good afternoon. I was going to say good morning, but good afternoon. Um, this is the public comment hearing for the Hidden Falls Regional Park draft environmental impact report. We're here to receive comments from the public. Uh, they will be recorded. Uh, with I'm Lisa Carnahan from Planning Department. With me is Andy Fisher from the Parks Department, Andrew Gaber from uh, Department of Public Works, Sarah Gilmore from Engineering and Surveying, Deborah Bishop from EDAW, and various other county personnel. Um, just as a quick run through here, and then I'll let Andy get to the meat of the project description. Um, this is Hidden Falls here. As you can see, in between, sandwiched in between 49, the Bear River, Garden Bar Road, and Mount Pleasant Road. Here is a close-up of the project area, including the garden bar area. This is the Spears portion of the Hidden Falls Regional Park, what's known as the Spears Ranch portion. This is the Didion Park portion, or Didion Ranch portion of the park, with the existing, this is where the existing parking lot is. The, op the zoning is open space and it's surrounded by farm with various um, acreage. The proposal is to develop that remaining portion of, let me go back here, the re this remaining portion here, it's to develop this remaining portion, expand this parking lot, and with the development here would be to make improvements to the Garden Bar Road. Um, today and during the, um, public review comment, we will be receiving comments. We'll be receiving them verbally as well as written today. And the, <coughs> after the comment period and what, uh, when the EI, final EIR is written, we'll come back to the Planning Commission for um, a request for a conditional use permit and for certification of the EI, final EIR. Uh, there has been considerable out public outreach done throughout this process. We've gone to 13 uh, municipal advisory council meetings. We've done, uh, held stakeholder workshops with uh, various community members. And then we've incorporated the comments from those meetings into the draft environmental impact report that you have. Uh, during the 45-day public review period, which began June 17th, and ends July 31st. Uh, people from the public are uh, able to provide verbal comments today and written comments anytime within that 45 day comment period. And responses to those comments will be made in the final EIR, um, which in that final EIR will be available to the public online through the library, uh, various sources they can ask for a copy of the CD. Um, and with that, I'm going to forward it over to Andy Fisher, who will discuss the, the meat of the project. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Uh, in addition to uh, the part of our process today, which is to receive public comment, part of our environmental process. We were really pleased to bring it before your commission today to give you some exposure to this project. I think this is the first time that we have officially come before you in the context of Hidden Falls Regional Park. So we're pleased to do that. 
want to give you a little bit of ba uh, background and be as brief as possible so we can all get out to lunch uh, and receive the comments that we, that we need to in due time. Hidden Falls Regional Park is made up of uh, two historic cattle ranches. The one that's open to the public today is uh, the eastern 220 acres, uh, formerly called Didion Ranch. Uh, the other side and the topic of most of our development planning for the EIR it was called the Spears Ranch. Uh, together they formed Hidden Falls Regional Park. It was named that by the board in uh, 2006. This uh, property altogether was purchased under the Placer Legacy Open Space and Agricultural Conservation Program. And just a word about that program, adopted by the board in June of 2000, the program was to, as the name implies, conserve agricultural resources and open space resources, recognized that there was uh, lacking in the western portion of the, of the county uh, passive recreation opportunities, as was uh, served in the eastern part of the county by the National Forest. And as part of the objectives of the legacy programs, uh, specifically looked to acquire one or more large regional parks in the western part of the county just for this purpose. So Hidden Falls Regional Park is a direct response to the goals of the legacy program. Spears Ranch was purchased in 2003, market value purchase price, uh, out of the legacy open space trust fund, which is a general, general fund supported program. So uh, as taxpayers, this was funded by you and owned by you in perpetuity. Um, the Didion Ranch, the portion of the park opened right now uh, to the public, was purchased in 2004. Also uh, major funding from the legacy trust account. Also very significant funding from private and public grant partners that we're very thankful for. What's out there right now? Uh, a large amount of blue oak woodland and a number of other habitats. We have about three miles of frontage on Coon Creek and Dead Man Creek, waterfalls, the namesake of the park, plus a number of other noteworthy waterfalls out there. Uh, cattle grazing continues today under a lease that's re that is retained by the Spears family until 2014. We expect that may continue, uh, probably will continue as a, as a component of our vegetation management ongoing beyond there. A uh, number of uh, different uh, riparian woodland habitats, as I mentioned, and the portion of the park that was open in 2006. Briefly, if you want to go out there, if you haven't been out there, I'd just direct you to our website where we do have a new fresh uh, trails map that's updated of what's out there right now and the portion of the park you can use. And if you don't catch that website right now, be sure and catch me afterwards, and I will be happy to direct you there but that will give you some direction if you want to use the park today. A little visual experience of what's out there today. Over on the right-hand side is the new observation deck over Hidden Falls that we just opened up. Here is a, uh, the turnout for a single volunteer workday. We have a tremendous support of volunteers and folks in the community wanting to be involved in Hidden Falls, and we're very thankful and excited about that. Uh, some other scenes from Hidden Falls. This is an eagle that fledged too early, was... Uh, was picked up by a game warden, nursed back to health, and released out at Hidden Falls. So all kinds of different habitats and wildlife and so forth out there for the public to enjoy. There's a picture in the center there of the staging area um, in, the, in the park that's open right now. This would be on the portion of the park we call Didion Ranch. That's off of Mears Road, which is off of Mount Vernon Road, just west of town here about three miles. A planning map for the features of the park that we want to, uh, to develop, and I'd like to draw your attention to this portion over here that's hatched. We call this our facility development zone. So as I get into a little detail on the features of the park, and I talk about a nature center, uh, I talk about a staging area that's proposed, and some of the more intensive uses, um, although all of it is very passive uh, in terms of grading or, or any kind of mass grading, it would be very minor in the proportion to the entire park. But those kind of uses, those, uh, those uh, parking, nature center, et cetera, would happen within this facility development zone. And the rest of the park would be a network of trails. Uh, some of these, um, these trails have been planned by, by user groups, trail consultants that we have uh, hired, and we put an awful lot of thought into that. We're pretty excited about the prospects of a trail network out there. Uh, but the rest of the park would basically be, be designated for, for trail use, passive use, uh, bridges over Coon Creek that would serve emergency services and uh, the trail network, the circulation network of the park. The trails are planned to be multi-use but non-motorized. Again, the portion of the park that's open to the public right now that you can go out and use and there's the parking area. What we're planning in the remainder of the park, we have open right now about seven miles of trail if you go out there today. We're expecting to have another 14 miles of trail that we will build 
plus about 10 miles of existing ranch roads that are already there that we hope to, uh, to just shape up and regrade and make more sustainable, get the ruts out of, uh, make some drainage improvements, and that would also be used as part of the, uh, the, uh, the trail network. So altogether, we expect to have just over 30 miles of trail on site. We are planning to expand the existing Mears Road parking area. I do want to briefly correct a statement in our table in the beginning of our EIR. We talk about that expansion, and we do have an arithmetic area, uh, uh, arithmetic error. What we have out there right now is 50 paved parking places. We have space for approximately six horse trailers, at least that's what we plan. Depending on how they park themselves, they can either park like cordwood or one or two can park longitudinally. So you'll see anywhere from, from two to to 12, but we want to expand that. We want to about triple that area if we can to, to uh, an additional 12 equestrian parking places. Um, so that would be a total of 75 paved parking, uh, parking places and, uh, and space for uh, 18 horse trailers roughly. So, and we do have a math error in our table in the beginning. We will correct that. Uh, we are planning on a new parking area via Garden Bar Road. I'll talk a little bit more about the improvements associated with that along Garden Bar Road, off-site improvements that we're proposing as we go on, and access improvements to get there. Additionally, as we have permanent restroom facilities here at this staging area, we would, we would uh, try to provide those uh, at, the, at the new staging area off Garden Bar as well. Bridge crossings, as I mentioned, would serve emergency services to be able to, to serve both sides, north and south of Coon Creek, plus the, uh, the trail network. We do hope to expand. We do have one accessible trail on site right now. You can see a portion of it right there. We hope to be able to, to uh, put more of that on the western part of the property. Uh, picnic areas, fishing access, an interpretive program, uh, nature and cultural education center, as I mentioned, that would be within that facility development zone. And a group camping area, and I want to mention this real quick, we do get comments about group camping and what that might mean in terms of fire risk, et cetera. The, the concept is not to allow ever uh, folks to go throughout the park and find their own campsites. It would be to place one group camping area within the same proximity of this nature cultural education center where we would be able to support groups with reservations permitted up to about 60 people, up to 60 people is what we're proposing. And uh, that, so the fire pits that would be associated with that group camping area would be one or two. They would be contained in, in metal or concrete uh, fire rings in areas that are widely cleared. So for anybody who is uh, concerned that, uh, that those could be dispersed throughout the property, that is not our intention. We do expect we will uh, develop or uh, recondition or both uh, groundwater wells out there to serve the project. The water needs out there are fairly low. They would be about the same as one or two equivalent dwelling units. So we wouldn't uh, expect to have a lot of drawdown in, uh, in, in, uh, in water. It is an area of fairly low yield wells. So uh, fire suppression facilities, I will um, illustrate a little bit later. Is, uh, we, we, like most folks surrounding that area, are very concerned about fire and have embarked on a very vigorous program to, uh, to, to minimize that risk of fire. And that includes about 120 acres of shaded fuel breaks. Uh, we already have a 12,000 gallon uh, storage tank and hydrant system at the staging area that's open right now and we would mimic that uh, on the other side of the property as well. This golf course is a proposal. It's a request that we had at the beginning of this project. We've heard a number of comments about the, the type of activity that can go on, uh, you know, illicit activity that's sometimes associated with those. We, as the management entity, and we would, the county parks division would be the management entity in perpetuity for this park, really share those management concerns. So if we decided to move forward with a disc golf course, it would be in consultation with other agencies. It would be with some very positive management controls on that use, uh, perhaps a, a sunset clause or a kind of thing that we could uh, gracefully and easily get ourselves you know, out of it if there were problems. So I just want to make it clear that as the management entity, we, sh we share those concerns as well and would be very cognizant of those going forward. Film and theater production goes on out there already. There's been a number of those um, advertisements and, uh, and film scenes shot out there. Goodyear was the last one I was aware of, shot a tire commercial out there recently. So we expect that to continue. Managed hunting of legal game and nuisance animals, and this is also a, a topic that's received a lot of uh, comment. So let me elaborate briefly. We do not expect, we will not allow 
and just open hunting on the park. That's not our intent at all. There would be two really categories of hunting. One would be uh, in conjunction with the, the county trapper and the fish and game department on nuisance animals because we do have a very significant um, wild pig deprivation problem out there. So that would go on as it would on any property. You consult with fish and game, the county trapper, and you proceed. Additionally, we would like to, and we're proposing the ability to, two days a year, close the park to the public and have up to 10 hunters. So that would be kind of a lottery, perhaps a fundraiser sort of an activity, and we would just like to have that option uh, in the future. But it would be very controlled and very limited. We are also proposing uh, events, what happens when folks want to have uh, cross-country events, for example. The cross-country coaches have approached us, a number of the different uh, Boy Scout groups and so forth. So we looked carefully at the carry capacity of the park, uh, what we were planning, and our engineers and consultants um, and county staff have come up with a number and fire officials of carrying capacity of, of 200 people that could be allowed to, uh, to reserve portions of the park. The intent would not be to close the park, but that uh, we could support up to 200 people in an, in an event reserved at a time on the western portion of the property. Again, the same map, just to, uh, to show you again graphically what we would have in mind. Uh, in terms of, of the events that I was just describing, uh, we have not allowed events on this portion of the park because of the bottleneck nature. We don't think that we could uh, reserve any portion of the park without closing the park in its entirety and we don't want to do that. We actually have a pretty uh, uh, number of our users come from the Bay Area and from abroad and it would be very surprising and, and we don't want to do that to folks. On this end of the property uh, we do expect that, uh, that we could cordon off portions of the park without the entire park being closed. So this would be the area that events would be reserved. We want to talk a little bit about phasing because all of those project features are not expected to happen at once and they're not all funded. In phase one, which would happen essentially as soon as uh, approvals were in place, uh, we would build the rest of the trail system, emergency access bridges, and uh, we would have the ability to develop the ranch house into the nature center. Um, we would only use, though, the entrance, the westerly entrance to the property off of Garden Bar Road for staff, for business, for the same kind of things we do today where you come in and you lock the gate behind you. It's just staff. Uh, and consultants and so forth, utility personnel that use that. That would continue in phase one. All of the public during the normal open hours, sunset, sunrise to sunset, would continue to use this staging area off Mears Road. We would not build the new staging area in phase one. Um, and this would be the phase that we would expect to expand the Mears parking lot that I described earlier. But the public would still use this, this staging area. In phase two, we would allow general public access for open hours with gates open onto the new staging area off of Garden Bar Road. That would be the major difference. We would not, however, allow uh, horse trailers in phase two. The reason being that horse trailers, our consultants and engineers um, have told us, would require a larger degree of widening and improvements to Garden Bar Road. So what we would propose before general public traffic used the staging area the new staging area off Garden Bar Road is that we would widen Garden Bar Road from Mount Pleasant up to our uh, entrance to the park, which is roughly three miles, I believe. It's a pretty long ways up Garden Bar Road. We would widen that to 18 feet. We would include two foot shoulders. And there are a number of vertical curves with sight distance problems that we would, um, that we would improve in those curves that specifically are outlined in the traffic report and the traffic safety report. We would also include signing and striping <laughs> requirements that are recommended by our traffic engineer. So that's our proposal and this would happen before the general public went in to that new staging area. We're very aware that folks who live along Garden Bar Road are concerned about traffic and we share that as well. Um, we also have some obligations and we would widen, uh, we are, we're actually two parcels removed from Garden Bar Road but we have easement rights over that. So we would also improve the road over that easement section uh, to get into the new staging area. A gate would be placed um, between the new staging area and the ranch house. What's important about that um, is that we want to confine general public, the vehicles, to the staging area on the very far western portion of the property and not allow them to disperse within the park. So that's the intent of that note. In phase three, we would have additional widening requirements on Garden Bar Road, widen it to 20 feet, 
uh, improve horizontal curves, and phase three would allow horse trailers. We would also in, uh, build a, an equestrian staging area on the western portion of the park, and then we could allow horse trailers. Folks have asked about the timeline. Phase one, we do have some funding for. We've been very successful in receiving grants for this project. We have about three million, um, roughly, right now toward the construction of phase one improvements only. Uh, not including the Nature, edu the Nature Education Center, um, we would begin to construct the, uh, the trails and bridges as soon as we are entitled. And right now, actually, the, uh, I don't know if you've read the news, but grants uh, under the, the state proposition bond funding have been frozen for a couple years, and it's a little uncertain when that's going to come back to us and when we can begin spending that money again. But assuming that all comes together, uh, we would uh, optimistically be able to open those trails to the public in 2011. Phase two, we have not gone looking for funding. We don't have funding for those improvements on Garden Bar Road or the staging area, so phase two and three are completely dependent on the identification of funding. I did want to uh, just briefly uh, set Hidden Falls in a larger context of some other open space areas. These properties right here, about 800 acres worth, were also, uh, they were, they're owned in fee or by easement by the Placer Land Trust. The county's participation in that uh, did include trail access to these parcels, and we have a grant right now to study uh, the feasibility of trail access from Hidden Falls to these properties. So, so we are uh, looking at expanding even beyond just the confines of Hidden Falls Park into some of these larger parcels. Another slide similar showing some of the other Williamson Act parcels in the area and just to show that, gar that the Big Hill area that we're in is a, has had some, uh, a large degree of conservation. And just to, uh, to address in closing the fire risk reduction plans that we have, here is a, a map of the fuel breaks that we're currently engaged in building right now. Altogether, it's a little over 100 acres worth of fuel breaks. They will allow, uh, in the unfortunate event, hopefully will not happen, uh, a fire breaks out either on the park coming toward it or in the park going out of it. It would allow staging of fire personnel and at least some, uh, some positive break, although it would not stop a conflagration by anybody's estimation. It would create some kind of a defensible break that hopefully the fire could be slowed and stopped. Uh, altogether, that's about a $500,000 proposition to, uh, to build all of these fuel breaks. And that's what they look like. We do get some concern. Folks say, is it going to look like a power line clearing? And the answer is no. Uh, shaded fuel brakes are really thinning. They're not clearing. And this is what a shaded fuel brake looks like when it's done. The understory is cut out. And uh, some of the trees are thinned out so that sunlight can get in, actually also so that borate can get in uh, if, if, in fact, they need to drop the, uh, the fire retardant on a, on a fire in there. But this is what it looks like. We have no intention of clear cutting. We wouldn't want to do that. And uh, that is, that's the end of our presentation. Sandy, uh, just a kind of a quick question. I think you've yes. answered at least it's clear in the document. But when you go down uh, Garden Bar Road and you pull up to the gate, there's a sign on the gate. And uh, that sign shows a, uh, appears to show a parcel of private property still within the Spears Ranch uh, property. There was. That, that remained uh, in the possession of the Spears for a time after they sold the rest of the property, and that gave them an opportunity to relocate, and that now has been dissolved. We just haven't changed the sign. Okay. But we own all of it. Okay. Now. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. If there's anyone from the public that would like to comment on the document, now's your opportunity. Mr. Chairman, if I could just remind everybody that uh, comments today should be focused on the adequacy of the draft EIR and not the merits of the project. Uh, the comments that are received today as well as the written comments will be responded to in the final EIR. Uh, so therefore, the, the staff will be listening to those comments but will not be providing a response. We'll respond to those in the final EIR. Um, also, if you're coming up to comment on the project, please uh, uh, fill out the sign-in sign sheet, your name, address, information uh, like that, so we can take note of that and provide you uh, responses to, the, to our comments after the, when the final EIR is available. Also, there is uh, a comment sheet in, at the back table that you can pick up and provide written comments if you feel to do it, uh, provide comments that way. Thank you. 
Okay, now's your opportunity. <laughs> Afternoon, I'll start. Uh, my name is Gary Matavi. Uh, my address is 5500 Blue Oak Ranch Road. My property is directly adjacent to the park. It actually abuts the new, the new portion of the park. And um, I've been working with Andy for years uh, on the project, and I definitely support the project. It's a great project, but I have two major issues I want to bring up. One is fire. Um, Andy addressed it, but I'm concerned, and there's 20 other parcels that are adjacent to the park that I'm sort of representing because they're not here today. And the concern is that any discussion of, of, of allowing fire inside the park um, could lead to other people, you know, believing that it's approved to have fires in the park. And I'm very concerned about what the, the potential mitigation and firefighting capabilities would be, including on staff personnel in the park to, to maintain the fact that there are no fires. That's one major concern. The second one is hunting. Um, I personally have worked depredation permits with the county trapper and with the, uh, uh, the uh, game warden uh, for the feral pigs, so they are there. Um, however, all the residents are dead against any other hunters coming in there. Um, there are residences all above the park on the ridges on all sides and uh, people winning lotteries to come in there to shoot, um, especially rifles, would be a very large concern for everyone. Um, working with the county trapper and the, uh, um, and the uh, wildlife management groups, no problem. We've done that before. Uh, we were successful last year in thinning some of the feral pigs. Um, the, 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 the related comment to that is there currently is quite a bit of hunting in the park. Uh, it's called poaching. Um, pretty much every Sunday morning there's rifle shots and shotgun shots down there, whether it's turkeys or are prevalent or whether feral pigs or whether deer. So there's a lot of gunshots in there already. And, and adding to that problem I think is a, is a major concern for all the residents. Um, I don't know of any plans to staff the park with, with rangers or anything that would be able to support that. But I do know, having talked personally with the game warden, that the area is too large for him to be able to support and, and ever catch a poacher because by the time he gets the report and gets out there, they're long gone. And they are definitely there. Um, third comment I mentioned too, third one is a lesser um, than those two, but I, but I really uh, want to comment that I feel for the people on Mears, Mears Road and Mears Place with the amount of traffic that's coming in there now. And to the extent that phase two and phase three never happen and we allow more horse trailers and more access via vehicle up Mears Place, it's going to get even more dangerous than it is now. Um, the road, Mears Place is actually the, the final road off Mears Road that comes into the park and it is not wide enough. And there's many, many times when horse trailers are coming up the road, cars are coming down and there's not enough room for both cars. Um, and so it's actually a very dangerous situation. So I'd like to understand what may happen in terms of Mears Place to make that a safer access to the park. Thank you. Okay, next one, just, just come right up and give us your name. And My name is Bob Gabler and I live at 7825 Mears Drive. And uh, I'm against the hunting out there because I already have a bullet hole in one of my windows on my house. Uh, oh, okay. Coming from now, that direction. Now, one of, one of the things, let's try to keep it onto the environmental document. It's not whether you, you like it or, you know, for it against its, you know, how it pertains to the document. Well, I also feel the road isn't wide enough. Is that part of it? Mm -hmm. The Mears Drive is not wide enough, and I don't know how they circumvented the uh, EIR on the Didion portion. Uh, evidently, there's no EIR on that part, so. And uh, the gate has been left unlocked for many times that I've gone out there at night. And I think the supervision, the policing of that part should be improved upon. And uh, uh, the no hunting and also the disc golf. I don't approve of having disc golf out there since it's been labeled as uh, druggy golf by your law enforcement agencies in this county. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks. My name is Maggie Fincher. I live at 4154 Garden Bar Road, and I have lived there for 38 years. Uh, one of my big concerns is also fire, that even if there's a fire suppression on the ranch itself, what about all the neighbors? We had a fire Labor Day weekend on Wise Road, which is a very wide, well-traveled, easily accessed road, and yet it was a horrible situation for everyone in the neighborhood, especially all of us who have livestock. The property between this ranch and Garden Bar and Mount Pleasant intersection is about three and a half miles. 
Currently, it's extremely difficult to get fire equipment up there, and I hear that you're saying you're going to improve that road, but there's nothing that's going to make a fire truck get up there very quickly when the nearest fire department is approximately 12 miles away in Lincoln or a voluntary fire department at Fruitvale and Fowler. If there's a fire between that ranch and that intersection of Garden Bar and Mount Pleasant, there's not going to be any way out for the people who are on that ranch at the time the fire breaks out. Not to mention the speed that people use that road. Right now, they come from the windy section down into a straightaway, and they are flying, and there is no enforcement out there. I don't know if I can talk about the oak trees that we're going to lose along Garden Bar Road, but for some of us, if they widen the road, it'll be all our oak trees. We moved to an extremely rural area 38 years ago. I hate to see it change, and any improvements to these ranches and to access to the public is definitely changing our rural lifestyle. Thank you. Okay. If any, anybody else, just come, come right up and... <laughs> uh, Lee Bastian, Sheridan Mac. Uh, just two issues. Uh, one is the lady's comment about the fire. There is a proposal now to build a new fire station at McCourtney and Weiss Road that is in going through the planning process right now. And the second one is uh, the, we were concerned about the, during the environmental document review, they include the NID proposed pipelines. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, my name is George Davis and I live on Garden Bar Road. And when I see the proposal, I, I mean, I think the park is a great idea. I mean, I like the outdoors and everything, but I only see like Garden Bar Road is only gonna get improved from the beginning of Mount Pleasant on up. What about all the way from town? You're only improving part of it. A lot of it is the same type of road that goes all the way down into Lincoln. And I mean, you're only catching part of the problem. And uh, I think it just should be looked at to extend that further, uh, just for the safety factor. Okay. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the public that would like to comment on the document? Okay, seeing, seeing none, is there any wrap up or anything that you have? I was gonna add one comment earlier and, and forgot, but today we are operating under a conditional use permit and there was a mitigated negative declaration that was approved for the operation of the portion of the park that's open today. Our intent would be to uh, envelop and supersede that use permit with a new one that would cover the entire park when we return to you for approval. Okay, thank you. Okay, and now. Commissioner's comments? Do you have any? You made your comments earlier. <clears throat> That's one question, I guess, for Andy. How much, uh, since the fire seems to be one of the uh, prominent discussion points, how much additional revenue does the park for county seem to be able to get by having a group with that able to have a fire pit as opposed to without a fire pit? That's a good question. I don't know if there would be a difference. And in, in, you, you just... Uh, Referring to uh, the group camp area, what would be the, the pros and cons financially of having a fire pit there versus not? Is that the yes. question? That's a good question. I don't have an answer to that. And the uh, second question would be uh, concerning the hunting, almost the same question. How much additional revenue would the uh, hunting on site uh, provide for the county as opposed to no hunting? Any idea? The, uh, the proposal it was brought to us to allow that, and so we studied the impact analysis. We really have not looked at it from a financial perspective, and if we were allowed to do it, um, would certainly, again, as the management entity, want to be certain in ourselves uh, that it could be very controlled. But I don't, to, to answer your, spe your question specifically, I don't know what the market value of that hunt would be. Uh -oh. 
Okay, that's it. So with that, thank you for your participation in this and I'll go ahead and close today's meeting. Thank you.